Cardinal Carol Vortilia, the first pope from a communist country. To many Catholics, the departure from centuries-old staid protocol signals a resurgence of religious fervor. Charismatic movement. The media recorded every moment of this revolution. Forever changed the way the world saw a pope. He's also the first pope to kiss the Koran. May Gandhi live forever. Pope John Paul II's Theological Journey to the Prayer Meeting of Religions in Assisi Part 1 From the Second Vatican Council to the Papal Elections by Father Ioannis Dorman Foreword In this first of a planned three-volume series, I have referred back to articles which I have published and have developed the work there begun. The criticisms appearing in the meantime gave me no cause to make corrections. The objections brought forth are in large part from texts which I have not yet analyzed, but which I intend to go into in the course of the discussion. The planned second volume concerns itself with the major dogmatic encyclicals of John Paul II. The third volume with the pastoral visits of the Pope in Africa and Asia insofar as these are intimately connected with the occurrence at Assisi and with the official explanations immediately before and after the prayer meeting. Only due to the increasing profusion of material do the major traits of the theology and the pontificate of John Paul II come out clearly. And accurate interpretation of the Pope's thinking is our main concern. My publication one Truth and Many Religions, Assisi, among others, also serves this purpose. There, I have tried through a detailed analysis to describe the theological significance of the Assisi event. The effects of this model came to light in the subsequent meetings and similar gatherings. In the fundraising drive for World Mission Sunday 1989, sponsored by Missio Aachen and Missio Munich, in which every parish in West Germany participated, the following prayer was recommended for the Community Mass for World Mission Sunday, 1989. Be praised, O Lord God of Israel. You lead through impassable lands. You liberate from slavery and oppression. You promise a new world. Be praised, O Lord God of Mohammed. You are great and exalted. You are incomprehensible and unapproachable. You are great in your prophets. Be praised, O Lord God of Buddha. You live in the depths of the world. You live in every person. You are the fullness of silence. Be praised, O Lord God of Africa. You are the life in the trees. You are the fertility of father and mother. You are the soul of the world. Be praised, O Lord, God of Jesus Christ. You spend yourself in love. You surrender yourself in goodness. You triumph over death. By Anton Rotzetter. Strange though it was to many Catholics that this prayer should be permitted during the celebration of the Eucharist, one must not fail to recognize that it smacks distinctly of the spirit of Assisi. Chapter 1 The Assisi Prayer Service for Peace in the Light of Tradition and Vatican II Number 1. Pope versus Pope 
The World Prayer Meeting of Religions on October 27, 1986, in Assisi, with Pope John Paul II as host, was the high point of over a century of religio-historical development which had as its goal the fostering of peace and unity among the religions and peoples of the world. It lay within the nature of this interreligious and ecumenical movement for unity and peace that religious tolerance be fostered as a major benefit and that the Church's claim to be the sole possessor of the truth come under attack. Since the Catholic Church unflinchingly held fast to the binding character of the revelation made by the one and true personal God, she decidedly rejected any such movements for unity and peace up to the Second Vatican Council. Footnote The first draft of the Constitution on the Church of Christ from Vatican I, which, on account of the discontinuance of the Council, never came to a vote, took a position in the seventh chapter on the question of the relationship of the Church to other religions. The draft was an accurate rendering of the position of the Church at the time. Quote, Furthermore, it is a dogma of the faith that no one can be saved outside the Church. Nevertheless, those who are invincibly ignorant of Christ and His Church are not to be judged worthy of eternal punishment because of this ignorance, for they are innocent in the eyes of the Lord of any fault in this matter. God wishes all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, and if one does not what he can, God does not withhold the grace for him to obtain justification and eternal life. But no one obtains eternal life if he dies separated from the unity of faith or from communion with the church through his own fault. If anyone is not in this ark while the flood rages, he will perish. End quote. From this dogmatic standpoint follows the outlook on the other religions. The draft goes on. Quote, Therefore, we reject and detest that irreverent and irrational doctrine of religious indifferentism by which the children of this world, failing to distinguish between truth and error, say that the gate of eternal life is open to anyone, no matter what his religion. Or else they say that, with regard to religious truth, only opinion in varying degrees of probability is possible, and certainty cannot be had. Likewise, we condemn the ungodliness of those who shut the door to the kingdom of heaven to their fellow men with the false pretense that to desert the religion in which one was born or educated and brought up, even if that religion is false, is unbecoming, or that it is not at all necessary for salvation. They blame the church for professing itself to be the only true religion and for condemning and proscribing all religions and sects separated from communion with it, as if justice could ever have anything in common with iniquity, or light with darkness, or Christ meet with Belial. The Church Teaches, 10 Books, 1973, page 91. The position of the Church towards non-Christians was presented by the Popes above all in the so-called Mission Encyclicals of Leo XIII through John XXIII. See my article in Theologisches 5, 1987, 21-29. As for the ecumenical endeavors, see the Encyclical of Leo XIII, Satis Cognitum, of June 29, 1896, Pius XI's Mortalium Animos of January 6, 1928, and the Monitum from the Holy Office of June 6, 1948, as well as the Instruction on the Ecumenical Movement of December 20, 1949. Theologisches 3, 1988. End footnote. By the Church's acceptance of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, however, that movement, without modifying its position, found admission into the Catholic Church and achieved ultimately, under John Paul II in Assisi, its temporary peak. Fundamentally, the movement for unity and peace among all religions did not change, but the Church's position towards it 
did. Only a few decades before Vatican II, Pope Pius XI expounded sound arguments grounded in traditional teaching in support of the Catholic Church's position on the ecumenical and interreligious unification movement. He did this in his encyclical Mortalium Animos, January 6, 1928, on the fostering of true religious unity. Since Pope Pius XI discusses our subject matter in this encyclical, it is fitting that we consider it in more detail. The position of Pius XI may be regarded as representative of that of the preconciliar popes regarding the unity and peace movement. Pius XI appreciated the world's longing for unity, which found its concrete expression in the modern religious congresses. He describes the makeup of these congresses when he speaks of, quote, a large number of listeners present, at which all, without distinction, are invited to join in the discussion, both infidels of every kind and Christians, even those who have unhappily fallen away from Christ or who, with obstinacy and pertinacity, deny his divine nature and mission. Now, the same can be said of those representatives of the world religions and world organizations invited to Assisi. Pius XI, however, judged that, quote, such efforts can meet with no kind of approval amongst Catholics, end quote. Pius XI also spoke of the ideas and motives which give rise to the organization of religious congresses. Since there are very seldom people without any sort of religious outlook, one believes, quote, a hope that all nations, although they differ among themselves in certain religious matters, will, without much difficulty, come to agree as brethren in professing certain doctrines, which form, as it were, a common basis of the spiritual life, end quote. The participants in such congresses base their views and their actions on the erroneous opinion that, quote, all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy since they all in different ways manifest and signify that sense which is inborn in us all and by which we are led to God and to the obedient acknowledgement of his rule. Such thoughts were likewise submitted as the justification for the prayer meeting at Assisi. Pius XI said regarding this, quote, not only are those who hold this opinion in error and deceived, but also in distorting the idea of true religion, they reject it, and little by little turn aside to naturalism and atheism, as it is called, from which it clearly follows that one who supports those who hold these theories and attempt to realize them is altogether abandoning the divinely revealed religion. End quote. In the above text, Pius XI has religious congresses in mind, hence dialogues, not interfaith services. The interreligious liturgical practice of the Church since the Council, which has far surpassed congresses, and moreover the fact that a Pope himself has organized such prayer services, would have been inconceivable to Pius XI. It is indisputable that the position of the Church since the Council towards non-Christian religions constitutes a radical break with tradition. Pius XI saw, as does John Paul II, the interreligious yearning for unity in close connection with the ecumenical movement. The ideas which were supposed to promote, then as now, the unity of Christians, are summarized by Pius XI in the following. Quote, Is it not right, it is often repeated, indeed even consonant with duty, that all who invoke the name of Christ should abstain from mutual reproaches and at long last be united in mutual charity? Who would dare to say that he loved Christ unless he worked with all his might to carry out the desires of him who asked his father that his disciples might be one. 
And did not the same Christ will that his disciples should be marked out and distinguished from others by this characteristic, namely that they loved one another? All Christians, they add, should be as one, for then they would be much more powerful in driving out the pest of irreligion, which, like a serpent, daily creeps further and becomes more widely spread, and prepares to rob the gospel of its strength. These things and others, that class of men who are known as pan-Christians, continually repeat and amplify. And these men, so far from being quite few and scattered, have increased to the dimensions of an entire class, and have grouped themselves into widely spread societies, most of which are directed by non-Catholics, although they are imbued with varying doctrines concerning the things of faith. This undertaking is so actively promoted as in many places to win for itself the adhesion of a number of citizens, and it even takes possession of the minds of very many Catholics and allures them with the hope of bringing about such a union as would be agreeable to the desires of Holy Mother Church, who has indeed nothing more at heart than to recall her erring sons and to lead them back to her bosom. But in reality, Beneath these enticing words and blandishments lies hidden a most grave error, by which the foundations of the Catholic faith are completely destroyed. End quote. Then, too, Pius XI concerned himself with the criticism of the Catholic Church and the papacy by the pan Christians. He thereby called attention to the cooperation of individuals who give to the Pope primacy of honor and, with the consent of the faithful, concede a certain jurisdiction. It is of great import when he says, quote, Others, again, even go so far as to desire the pontiff himself to preside over their mixed assemblies, end quote. In summary, Pius XI takes the following position, quote, this being so, it is clear that the Apostolic See can by no means take part in these assemblies, nor is it in any way lawful for Catholics to give such enterprises their encouragement or support. If they did so, they would be giving countenance to a false Christianity quite alien to the one Church of Christ." End quote. Ecumenical services are, naturally, more theologically significant than discussions at ecumenical gatherings. Ecumenical services fell under church law, Code of Canon Law, 1917, in the section, quote, communicatio in sacris, and came under ecclesiastical penalties. Footnote, 1917, Code of Canon Law, Canons 2314 to 2316. In the 1983 Code of Canon Law, Canon 1365, it is said, Reus vetite communicationis in sacris justa pena puniatur. A person guilty of prohibited participation in sacred rites is to be punished with a just penalty. When the Pope himself sets an example by presiding over common interreligious service, there can indeed be no talk of a forbidden common religious service on the part of a priest or a bishop. Klaus Moersdorf, in his book Kirchenrecht, 1961, presents the position taken by the Church until immediately before the Second Vatican Council in the following, quote, As a community of believers at worship presupposes a unity of belief, so naturally common worship with followers of one or more Christian denominations is forbidden. The ecumenical practice of the Church since the Council, and, moreover, the fact that the Pope himself organizes such ecumenical services, where Protestant bishops in public, such as Bishop Kruse in Augsburg, for example, can publicly expound, uncontested, anti-Catholic positions on ecclesiology, stands in sharp contrast to the preconciliar position and teaching of the Catholic Church. Joint prayer services with members of non-Christian religions, Protestants and Orthodox, would have been unimaginable before Pius XI. 
he sees the relation and the position of the church towards non-Christians and non-Catholics as clearly defined by the Catholic faith. The doctrinal position which Pius XI takes in Mortalium Animos may be outlined as follows. Since there is only one true religion, namely the revealed one, there is hence for non-Christians only one way to truth and life, the way of conversion to the religion and church of Jesus Christ. Since there is only one true church established by Jesus Christ, there is hence only one way for non-Catholics, the return to the Catholic Church. The unadulterated Catholic faith, without qualifications or deletions, is the bond of unity. Love alone cannot bring separated Christians together. The break with the position and teaching of the Church, as explained in Mortalium Animos, could hardly be more brazenly demonstrated than at the prayer meeting of all religions at Assisi. The believing Catholic, who has experienced an awakening of the senses in his respect for the office of Peter through this break, cannot be satisfied with the explanation of the Assisi event as simply the product of an historico-religious development. For the Catholic, the fact that the Vatican itself with the Pope at the center, strove for and prepared the interreligious prayer service at Assisi, is a significant church event which shakes his belief in the one true church. Pope stands against Pope, the preconciliar church against the postconciliar church. Both popes, Pius XI and John Paul II, are for him the highest teachers of the church and appointed by Christ as guardians and guarantors of the faith. For the Catholic who sees his faith as based on Holy Scripture and tradition, the Assisi event is an incident without precedent in either Scripture or in the entire tradition of the Church and therefore finds no support therein. Assisi touches the substance of biblical revelation and the Catholic faith. These problems for the faith, raised at Assisi, cannot be lightly dismissed with the charge of backwardness or conservative rigidity, nor can they be simply discarded as the official church uninterruptedly forges ahead on the path of interreligious dialogue and worship, nor can they be dismissed by referring to living or dynamic concepts of tradition. Neither can the believing Catholic be content with a vague reference to Vatican II. Rather, he has the right and duty to ask the question, what are the dogmatic grounds on which John Paul II claims to justify interreligious prayer gatherings such as Assisi? The three addresses of John Paul II on the World Day of Prayer annotate indeed the strongly symbolic closing ceremony of the event but give no sufficient answer to the question. They are not dogmatic treatises, but take into account the day itself and reflect the consensus of all those taking part. There thus remains, in regards to Assisi, the unanswered question. What are the dogmatic grounds, derived from the same deposit of faith which the Pope is obliged to defend, on which the members of the world religions were invited to Assisi on the Pope's initiative, in order to achieve, as the Pope explained, true and lasting peace on the confident prayer of all religions, and therewith to usher in the, quote, beginning of a new age. The Catholic can only adequately comprehend a papally organized ecumenical prayer meeting when he sees it through the eyes of the Pope, that is, when he considers it in the light of the Pope's theology. Next, he proceeds to the obvious assumption of the identity of the faith of the Church with that of the Pope. In the same way, he does not question John Paul II's intentions. The personal initiative of John Paul II to organize the World Day of Prayer for different religions was no spontaneous decision, but rather the final result of an entire theological development. 
for an adequate appraisal of this development, one must retrace the path to Assisi with the Pope, and hence the ascent of the mystical mountain. We will therefore try to mark the doctrinal milestones along the Pope's journey to Assisi. Number 2. The Assisi Prayer Service for Peace, the Public Manifestation of the Intentions of Vatican II? The theological heart of the Assisi event comes from John Paul II. At the invitation of the Pope, the representatives of the world religions, quote, out of deep loyalty to their respective religious traditions, or, quote, in the diversity of religions, offer their prayers to the highest power, or God, whom they invoke for the, quote, transcendent gift of peace. Yet, despite the joint services of various beliefs, we are given to understand that there is no question of syncretism. The practical realization of the prayer for peace of the various religions took place in the following manner. One after the other, the Buddhists, Hindus, Jainas, Muslims, Shintoists, African tribalists, Parsis, Jews, and Christians, quote, out of deep loyalty to their respective religious traditions, commended their way of salvation and offered their peace prayers before their divinity. The ways of salvation as taught by Siddhartha Gautama and the Shantiveda, the Shankara, Vardhamana Mahavira, Mohammed, Nanak Dev, the mythical ancestors Zarathustra, Moses, and Jesus of Nazareth all stood in a line. One after the other, and side by side, the following were presented before the eyes of the whole world as the highest power or a god. Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, the divine Brahman, the Jinnah, Allah, the numinous Kami, Namsat, the Great Thunder, Manitu, Ormazd, Yahweh, and the Triune God. For this interreligious service, with the Pope in the center, the Catholic rightfully expects a satisfactory explanation from the Pope himself based on the magisterial teachings of the Church. The Assisi event is no mere random occurrence but it touches the very substance of divine revelation and worship as set down in Scripture, namely the first commandment. John Paul II himself supplies the key to his interpretation of the prayer meeting with the statement, Look at Assisi in the light of the Council. This invitation of the Pope indicates to us the starting point of his own ascent up the mystical mountain, his journey to Assisi begins with Vatican II. The Council is thus more than a milestone along the way. For John Paul II, it is the theological basis. John Paul II himself emphatically set forth the relationship of Vatican II to Assisi. According to his words, the prayer meeting can be viewed as a, quote, visible illustration an exegesis of the events, a catechesis, intelligible to all, of what is presupposed and signified by the commitment to ecumenism and to the interreligious dialogue which was recommended and provided by the Second Vatican Council. Consequently, the Council documents in their entirety represent the crucial foundation for the interreligious Assisi prayer service and furnish the self-evident premises for the post-conciliar development of ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, from which, ultimately, the Assisi event resulted. Should the Council Fathers, who are still alive today, who certainly never envisioned this event at the Council, really view the interreligious service at Assisi as, 
quote, a public manifestation of what they then promulgated is the connection between the public manifestation and the alleged intentions of Vatican II really so apparent? The polyphonic echo of the prayer meeting does not tell in favor of a catechism intelligible for all, originating in the teaching of the Council. The reactions to the event were too widely divergent. Many were speechless and perplexed. A few saw in the prayer meeting of all religions the public manifestation of heresy, syncretism, apostasy, and the betrayal of the Christian faith. Others praised Assisi as an expression of theological broadness, religious tolerance, recognition long overdue for all religions as legitimate means of salvation and diverse ways of God's revelation, as a universal proclamation of the basic unity and similarity of religions, as a conclusive departure from an arrogantly usurped Christian exclusive claim to the truth, and as a final laying to rest of an outdated Christian mission to convert all nations. Even the Vatican felt obliged to attempt various explanations and vindications. The members of the other churches and Christian communities could hardly have had an interest in illustrating the teaching of the Council to viewers from all over the world. The same may be assumed for the participants from the non-Christian religions. These were concerned merely with the recognition of their noumena and means of salvation. They would hardly have viewed themselves as anonymous Christians. But no one expected that of them. Neither conversion nor syncretism, but legitimate pluralism, is the motto of the Pope, namely that all religions should offer their prayers for peace, out of deep loyalty to their respective religious traditions. The various confessions and religions came along many roads to Assisi in order to pray to many different gods. The world of today, liberal and tolerant to the core, celebrated at Assisi the official laying of the cornerstone for general religious harmony through the Pope, the representative of ecumenism and the world religions. The Pope's thesis that Assisi is the realization of the exhortations and decisions of the Second Vatican Council is of historical significance for the Church. With this thesis, the Pope himself makes the interreligious service of Assisi the test case for the credibility of the Council. If the thesis is correct, then the Council stands or falls with Assisi. Then the Council Fathers must answer the question on what doctrinal grounds did they base their wishes and decrees, namely in favor of a common worship in the diversity of religions, a decision condoned by the vast majority. In that case, the Council must produce evidence to support their claim that this interreligious service, which is unique in the history of the Church, is substantially confirmed by revelation and Church doctrine. Is Assisi thus the public manifestation of a radical break with revelation and Church teaching, a break sanctioned by the Council? If so, one must then speak of a pre-conciliar and post-conciliar church in the sense of two churches which are incompatible, for the identity of the Catholic faith is one and the same with the identity of the Catholic Church. If the Pope's thesis does not hold true, that is to say, if the Council documents furnish in their totality and in their interpretation of tradition no sound basis for the interreligious prayer service at Assisi, then the Pope appeals in vain to the Council. Thus he relies on his own understanding of the Council and on a post-conciliar development which is unauthorized by the Council. For John Paul II, these alternatives do not exist. He has no doctrinal objections to the Assisi prayer service or its consequences. On the contrary, he is fully convinced 
that the Holy Spirit himself has spoken through the Council to the Church of today on the questions of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Thus, to justify his journey to Assisi, he appeals to the highest court. Consequently, the Pope regards the Second Vatican Council as the theological basis for the World Day of Prayer of the various religions. Of course, John Paul II's appeal to the highest court does not exclude his further appeal to Holy Scripture and the entire 2,000-year tradition of the Church in favor of the prayer meeting. He claims to solve this doctrinal incompatibility in the following manner. He stresses, on the one hand, the unbroken continuity of the Council and Assisi with Scripture and tradition, yet without any firm basis in Holy Scripture or Church doctrine. On the other hand, he underscores the obviously singular novelty of the prayer meeting in the history of the Church. He understands the novelty in no way as a break with Scripture and tradition, but as a, quote, more complete awareness of the mystery of Christ, and a, quote, complete universal self-understanding of the Church which was allotted to Christendom through the Council. Herewith, we have outlined the Pope's theological position regarding the interreligious prayer service of Assisi. We must examine this position in the doctrinal context of genuine tradition, which may be paraphrased as follows. It is a time-honored, established teaching of the Church, expressly confirmed by Vatican II, that public revelation ended with Christ and the Apostles. Catholic theology recognizes, however, a certain accidental development of dogma, thus a deeper penetration into revealed truth on account of the depths of the truth of the faith and the perfectibility of human reason. The decisive question is thus, how does John Paul II base the new, more perfect knowledge of the mystery of Christ and a complete universal self-understanding of the Church on divine revelation and the tradition of the Church? Thus far, so much is certain. The Pope himself has no doctrinal objections against the interfaith prayer services. On the contrary, he considers Assisi a gift of grace from the Holy Spirit, which, before the beginning of the third millennium, will be bestowed upon Christianity and all mankind through the Council. One could say that John Paul II embodies this interpretation of the Council, which is, as it were, the soul of his pontificate. On the question of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, it is the positively new impulses of the Council which find a unique expression in the theology, spirituality, and administration of Archbishop Karl Wojtyla and future Pope. In this sense, John Paul II is a modern progressive theologian who represents the aggiornamento of the Council in person. He is a man of Vatican II. Number 3. The Program for Conciliar Renewal of the Church from the Perspective of Council Father Karl Wojtyla As a man of Vatican II, John Paul II sees in the Council the theological groundwork for the dynamic process of conciliar renewal within the Church, from which the Assisi event ultimately resulted. Karl Wojtyla was not only a prominent Council Father, for whom the Council represented the beginning of a steady renewal of the Church, but he was also a professor and bishop who oriented his educational work and led his diocese according to the spirit of the Council. Few of the Council Fathers could have reflected so intensively as he on the realization of the Council in theology and in the Church. In a treatise appearing shortly after the Council entitled the Second Vatican Council and the Work of Theologians, 
From his practical experience and expert competence, the Council Father and Professor Karl Wojtyla outlines the program for a post-conciliar theology. Here, we come across a procedure which was already a guiding principle in the theology of the author. He writes, quote, In the course of theological study of the Council documents, one must bear in mind the general picture and thereby refer constantly to certain ideas or even guiding principles, such as accomodata renovatio, ecumenism or dialogue, end quote. This procedure signals the danger that the manifold statements found in the extensive council documents as a whole become subordinate to those particular guiding principles so that the post-conciliar work of theologians is reduced to and concentrated on these certain ideas. In this way, Vatican II becomes as a whole a council of accomodata renovatio, ecumenism, and dialogue. The most fundamental of the guiding ideas mentioned above is the accomodata renovatio. It embraces ecumenism and interreligious dialogue as well as the post-conciliar work of theologians and bishops. What exactly does accomodata renovatio mean? Archbishop Wojtyla tells us himself in the chapter Introduction to Vatican II, Attempt at a Classification, 1968, as follows. It means a renewal which, in the terminology of the Council, is always used with the adjective accomodata, renovatio accomodata. This adjective stands for adapted to. The program of renewal must be adapted to the state of consciousness of the Church, that stage which the Church has reached through the Council. That would be the adaptation ad intra. The notion of adaptation, accommodation, includes, however, both aspects of conciliar thought. The adaptation ad intra is also brought about by the way of the adaptation ad extra and is dependent upon it. These two aspects, as already emphasized, do not separate the field of conciliar thought and practical experience, whose most important object is the Church, but they unite, they integrate. The adaptation ad intra, as the coming unto one's own essence, succeeds in the Church to the degree in which the adaptation ad extra is accomplished. The distinction of church activity ad intra and ad extra first appeared in the radio address of John the 23rd to the world on September 11, 1962. It reduces the idea of aggiornamento to a simple formula. Cardinal Wojtyla takes up the distinction and portrays with its help the conciliar principles of church renewal. Accomodata renovatio is the entire program of conciliar renewal of the Church. By that are meant four things. 1. The word program already implies a planned, organized transformation of the consciousness of the entire Church. Number 2. This transformation according to plan is a dynamic process which has its roots in the documents of the Second Vatican Council and marks the entire post-conciliar era. The Council should thus be understood as the starting point of a well-planned process of renewal. Number 3. At the same time, there arises a special interest in ecumenical and interreligious dialogue as a guiding principle. A further guiding principle would be to preach the opening of the Church to the problems of the world of today in the sense of the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes. Number four, the systematic transformation of the consciousness of the entire church is a process of adaptation under the aspects of ad intra and ad extra, which nevertheless remains a single integral process and as such should help the church come into her own essence. Point four of the cardinal's explanation appears somewhat abstract. What is the exact import of the statement? 
the basis of the entire renewal process, ad intra and ad extra, is that stage of consciousness which the Church has reached through the Council. This stage of consciousness is represented by the mind of the Council. It gazes simultaneously in two directions, ad intra and ad extra. The aspect ad intra concerns the relation of the conciliar to the pre-conciliar church. Accomodata renovatio under this aspect means that the pre-conciliar backward church arrives at the stage of consciousness of the conciliar church. Thus, the mind of the council becomes, as it were, the transformer which accomplishes transition from the preconciliar to the conciliar consciousness of the church. Such, then, is the adaptation ad intra. The aspect ad extra means an altered relationship between the conciliar church and the world of today, naturally in the spirit of Gaudium et Spes, unitatis redintegratio, ecumenism, dignitatis humanae, religious liberty, and nostra etate, religions. Accomodata renovatio implies under these aspects the renewal of the church and her consciousness through adaptation to the world of today. The basis of this dynamic process of adaptation is in turn that stage of consciousness which the church has reached through the council. The mind of the council is the motor or transformer. The opening to the world already belongs to the stage of consciousness of the conciliar church. The accomodata renovatio ecclesiae, through adaptation, however, goes much further. It brings about the opening of the church to the world through a dynamic process of transformation and adaptation. Such, then, is the adaptation ad extra. The dynamic process of adaptation of the consciousness of the entire church, ad intra and ad extra, is a unified process because both aspects originate in the stage of consciousness of the conciliar church and because the mind of the council unites and encompasses both aspects. The entire program of accomodata renovatio ad intra and ad extra can be boiled down to the simple formula, adaptation of the preconciliar church to the conciliar church, and the conciliar church to the modern world. Or, since Cardinal Wojtyla understands accomodata renovatio as an ecclesial expansion of consciousness, adaptation of the preconciliar to the conciliar consciousness of the church and of the conciliar consciousness to that of the modern world. The striking emphasis of consciousness in the mind of the Council is significant for the influence of existentialism on the thought and theology of Karl Wojtyla. The visionary paraphrase of the expected result of accomodata renovatio is of great interest. Broadly expressed, the success of the preconciliar church's adaptation to the postconciliar church which thus comes unto her own essence, is in direct proportion to the success of the Church's adaptation to the modern world, primarily, of course, through her adherence to the guiding principles of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue on the basis of religious liberty. Is that really the way to attain the essence of the Church of Christ? Can this statement of purpose be reconciled with the thesis of the identity of the conciliar church with the Catholic Church before the Council? The program of Accomodata Renovatio encompasses all spheres of church life, especially ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, which are explicitly stressed as guiding principles. The accomodata renovatio is especially important for our subject, namely the dialogue of the Church with non-Christian religions, which culminated in the Assisi event. It supplies, therefore, the highlights for our discussion. We have to examine which stage of consciousness the Council has attained in the eyes of the Pope, regarding the question of interreligious dialogue 
and how the accomodata renovatio ad intra and ad extra works out in practice. We are not so much concerned with the clarification of such vague concepts as the mind of the council or the stage of consciousness of the church as we are with the doctrinal basis of such notions in the theology of Karl Wojtyla as archbishop and pope. Chapter 2 Vatican II Bases or Instrument of the Accomodata Renovatio Number 1 The Second Vatican Council in Light of Assisi It is the profound conviction of John Paul II that the Holy Spirit speaks to the Church today through the Council and that the Church has paved the way to Assisi by means of ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. The Pope's challenge to the people of God runs, quote, Look at Assisi in the light of the Council, end quote. If the Holy Spirit has led the Church through the Council to Assisi, then the Spirit of the Council is identical with the Spirit of Assisi, then the problem of interreligious prayer services has been decided in the highest court, and the theological case is closed. Then the Church must follow the Pope, even to venture with the prayer for peace of all religions the beginning of a new age. But are the premises correct? It is quite evident, and therefore needs no explanation, that a singular event in the history of the Church, such as the prayer service at Assisi, neither has nor can have any solid doctrinal foundation in Holy Scripture or tradition. A joint interreligious prayer service of the Pope with representatives of the world religions goes far beyond what one could have imagined in the scope of biblical revelation and of Church doctrine up to the last council. Up to this date, the official declarations of the Church had strictly condemned interfaith worship. A papal encyclical such as Mortalium Animos, 1928, of Pius XI, or the former Canon Law, are diametrically opposed to the Assisi event. The sole theological basis of the prayer meeting of religions is then Vatican II, which represents undeniably a turning point in the history of the Church. Further, it stands to reason that a mere appeal to the last council is no adequate vindication of religious events, which most blatantly contradict Holy Scripture and Church tradition as a whole. Such a singular incident requires for its justification an equally singular theological foundation. It is contained in the thesis of the Pope, namely, that the Holy Spirit himself led the Church through the Council to Assisi. The appeal to this highest court is manifestly warranted in the light of historical and dogmatic circumstances. The appeal to the Second Vatican Council as the voice of the Holy Spirit in no way dispenses from the need for theological explanation. Though one might accept the official allegation that the documents approved by the Council are in full conformity with Scripture and tradition, the Council documents could not possibly supply the doctrinal basis for an incident such as Assisi, which, once again, is in most blatant contradiction with the whole of biblical revelation and church tradition. Hence follows a necessary dilemma. If the Council documents be the theological basis for Assisi, then they stand in contradiction to Scripture and tradition. If, however, they be in harmony with Scripture and tradition, then they cannot be the dogmatic basis for Assisi. The dilemma is not solved even by the most urgent appeal to the voice of the Holy Spirit. In solving the dilemma, nothing less than the identity of the Catholic faith and Church is at stake. It is furthermore 
an established fact that dialogue with the non-Christian religions, never an interreligious prayer service, was discussed at the council. The latter could thus never have occurred to the council fathers, much less have been raised or even voted upon. An incident like that of Assisi went far beyond what the majority of the fathers could have imagined, and therefore did not fall within their mental horizon. If we accept the Church's official version, which vigorously stresses the continuity and identity of the Catholic faith with the Council documents, then we reach the conclusion, neither scripture, tradition, nor the Council documents can be claimed as the doctrinal foundation for the Assisi worship. To that extent, the invitation of the Pope, quote, look at Assisi in the light of the Council, is of little help for the theological basis of the prayer meeting of religions. On the other hand, this motto reversed, look at the council in the light of Assisi, leads to the heart of the matter. The reversed motto reveals the theological standpoint of the Pope more plainly. In his own words, Assisi can be seen, quote, as a public manifestation of a teaching of facts, an all-understanding catechesis to be reflected upon, what the ecumenical effort and dialogue amongst religions recommended and initiated by the Second Vatican Council presupposes and means." End quote. Does the statement mean that the Second Vatican Council in the light of Assisi actually furnishes the theological foundation for the interreligious prayer meeting? then the consequences would be inevitable. The Council, with Assisi, would most blatantly contradict Holy Scripture and Church tradition as a whole. Then, too, the Council would mean a break with tradition and represent the unauthorized beginning of a wide-scale transformation of the entire Church and the Catholic faith. Then the Council, in the spirit of Assisi, would have become the foundation for and instrument of a total transformation of the church in her faith. If one takes a closer look, the matter becomes somewhat more complicated. The Pope says, upon closer examination, that the Council is the prerequisite and impulse for the post-conciliar dialogue among religions, which in turn brought about the Assisi event. No one can deny that, but the Pope's formulation makes the overall post-conciliar state of affairs abundantly clear. The full meaning and intention of the Council could be grasped only in retrospect in the process of post-conciliar development. Therefore, the spirit of Assisi completely unveiled the spirit of the Council hitherto concealed. In our proposed contrast, look at Assisi in the light of the Council, look at the Council in the light of Assisi, each of the opposing views figured in the dispute over the correct interpretation of the Council which marked and dominated the entire post-conciliar era. The eminent church historian Hubert Jeden, 1980, who in 1979 could not have even suspected the Assisi event, commented on this theological dispute as follows. Quote, a compromise between the two opposite views is not yet in sight. It can only be reached if one maintains that the Council, the highest authority in faith and morals, has established binding norms which one may neither ignore nor overstep. There is no turning back from the Council nor by the same token is the Council an initial thrust towards a wide-scale transformation of the Church in faith and morals and in her structure. Only by observing the Council itself can we reach equilibrium between tradition and progress and preserve the identity of the Church in a changing world. The position of Yedin surely reflects that of many Orthodox theologians of this entire period. Yedin observes, however, that theologians of another persuasion would view and exploit the Council as an initial thrust towards a wide-scale transformation of the Church in faith and morals 
and in her structure. The very identity of the church is at stake. But Yedin is a theologian faithful to the council, which he considers the highest authority in faith and morals, which also has established binding norms. He considers the council in continuity with tradition and as the guarantee for, quote, the identity of the church in a changing world. As Assisi shows, John Paul II has not chosen the way of compromise presented by Yedin, but that of dynamic development in post-conciliar interreligious dialogue. Thus, Assisi is clearly the beginning of a new age. The aim in view is the convergence of all religions. If we view the Council as the starting point of this development, we may then state the following. The Second Vatican Council has unquestionably carried out the opening of the Church to ecumenism, dialogue with other religions, and to the world. It follows from the basic character of a pastoral council that the pastoral renewal of the church can only be fully realized after the council. The period after the council becomes thus necessary for an era of post-conciliar pastoral reforms. The council had also desired to produce the doctrinal prerequisites and foundations for this euphorically celebrated departure into an unknown future. The Council, which designed the Church of the Future, may be understood as an initial thrust. The question, however, is, number one, whether in the light of Assisi the doctrinal point of departure created by the Council in view of the forthcoming adventure was really formulated in complete continuity with the traditional faith and with the necessary clarity. And number two, whether the post-conciliar development occurred in complete harmony with the Council itself, tradition, and Holy Scripture. The transition from the conciliar recommendation for dialogue to interreligious worship at Assisi is indeed significant. Just how this transition is warranted by the Council documents themselves, let alone finds its authorization or basis in the sources of biblical revelation and church tradition, is not readily obvious for everyone. Number 2 the Council Documents, a mix of traditional faith and modern theology. Even those, too, who are convinced of the dogmatic integrity and continuity of the Council Documents would have to notice that certain expressions and formulations can be found in various texts which are capable of being interpreted and applied in the sense of interreligious dialogue as it was practiced after the Council and which texts were repeatedly quoted until finally their hidden intentions became clear for all to see at an event like that of Assisi. For example, the guiding principle of the declaration Nostra Etate, 1, 1, regarding the role of the Church. Quote, in her task of fostering unity and love among men, and even among nations, she gives primary consideration in this document to what human beings have in common and to what promotes fellowship among them. End quote. This concerns the relationship of the Church to non-Christian religions. It sounds like a prelude to Assisi. As a second example, from Gaudium et Space, 78. Quote, Peace on earth, which flows from love of one's neighbor, symbolizes and derives from the peace of Christ, who proceeds from God the Father. Christ the Word made flesh, the Prince of Peace, reconciled all men to God by the cross, and, restoring the unity of all in one people and one body, he abolished hatred in his own flesh, Having been lifted up through his resurrection, he poured forth the spirit of love into the hearts of men. 
Therefore, all Christians are earnestly to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, and join with all peace-loving men in pleading for peace and trying to bring it about. Flannery, Documents of Vatican II, page 987, end quote. Does the unity of all in one people and one body mean the unity of the church and humanity? Have peace-loving men not united in Assisi in pleading for peace and trying to bring it about? There is no question that such loaded phrases in the council documents with no support in scripture or tradition have determined the post-conciliar development. On the other hand, there is the assertion that the council documents, as a whole and interpreted according to Holy Scripture and tradition, stand in unbroken continuity with the tradition of the Church and must, therefore, be considered the guiding principle for the post-conciliar renewal. This is quite unrealistic. The post-conciliar development could only come about thanks to such loaded phrases which were systematically built into the Council documents. In point of fact, the Council documents themselves are a mixture of traditional faith and progressive, new-sounding, loaded phrases presented with a modern theological gist. The post-conciliar development of the Church can be grasped only on the basis of this insight. Were we, for the sake of statistics, to conduct an experiment and determine the import of the Council documents in the light of Assisi, we would ask how many texts could be adduced for or against Assisi. The number of texts directly contradicting or excluding Assisi would far outweigh those in favor. Yet, the few texts in favor of Assisi have marked the Church's path, and specifically through a selective interpretation of the Council documents, combined with a resolute practice of interreligious dialogue. The dangers of selective interpretation of Council texts are manifest. Anyone, according to his own understanding of the Council, can single out a few notions from the whole of the Council documents, which, in turn, are proclaimed as an expression of the spirit of the Council and made the starting point of a far-reaching accomodata renovatio ecclesiae, thereby creating the possibility to employ Vatican II as the instrument of the total transformation of the Church. If the last Council is to be understood merely as an initial thrust, then modern theology becomes a decisive factor for the post-conciliar development of the Church. This becomes clearly evident in the case of interreligious dialogue. Shortly before the Council, in theology, a new way of looking at non-Christian religions made a major breakthrough, and this new outlook was at the time in contradiction to the official teaching of the Church. With regard to this changing constellation, Joseph Ratzinger remarked critically in 1966, thus immediately after the Council, quote, In the meantime, a teaching had gained more and more acceptance, although it was previously regarded only as a marginal thesis, namely that God wills and is able to save outside the Church, though in the end, not without her. Thereby, an optimistic understanding of the world religions was recently brought forth, the consideration of which once again makes clear that not all of the favorite thoughts of modern theology are at the same time biblically sound. For if anything may be called foreign, yes, even opposed to sacred scripture, then it is the current optimism with regard to the world religions which, in fact, conceives these religions as means of salvation, a view which can hardly be reconciled with their standing in biblical perspective." End quote. One may indeed say, the Council itself has set up the provision. 
and modern theology has paved the way for the church to Assisi by its appeal to the spirit of the council. Faced with the evident contradiction between revelation and tradition on the one side, and the position of the Second Vatican Council in the light of Assisi on the other, everything rests on the question, how did the last council, in the context of modern theology, lead up to the revolutionary change publicly manifested as Assisi? Number 3. The Pastoral Council and its Pastoral Language The Council as a, quote, New Pentecost, such was the eager expectation felt by certain Council Fathers and theologians at the beginning. The slogan, New Pentecost, was repeatedly mentioned after the Council, i.e., an appeal to the spirit of the Council, in order to get the main reforms adopted. Footnote. For example, it is in the accompanying text to Celebration of the Eucharist in Indigenous Form, Bangalore 1980, page 5, regarding the Second Vatican Council, quote, A new Pentecost in the Church. The Second Vatican Council, under the guidance of the Spirit, ushers in a unique period of renewal in the Church. End quote. A categorical statement of this kind, however, claiming for the Council such a theologically crucial role in the history of salvation, implies an overall evaluation of the Council's role in history, an evaluation hardly in keeping with the status of the Council documents themselves, containing as they do such various statements whose theological weight is frequently by no means obvious. Vatican II understood itself as a pastoral council, and wished to be thus understood. As John XXIII personally admitted, the convocation was, quote, inspired from on high. Footnote, opening address to the council October 11, 1962. The talk of a new Pentecost seems to have its datum point here. End footnote. The idea of a pastoral council came from the Pope himself. It was a novelty in the history of the Church, and was, however, readily approved by the majority of the Fathers. It was welcomed by many in order that, under pastoral pretenses and with dogmatic restrictions out of the way, a practical evolution according to their designs might take its course. What precisely was meant by a pastoral council can hardly be determined, according to Karl Rahner, because at the council, quote, there was no room for a theologically more involved consideration of the essence of a pastoral council as such, end quote. But the Pope indeed prevailed in bringing the Council Fathers around to the characteristics of his idea which so faithfully reflected his person and his brief pontificate. A remark of Patriarch Roncalli before the Conclave eloquently summarizes his future program as Pope. Quote, the Church is young. In the course of her history, she is always able to adapt. End quote. As a historian, he was well aware of the historical adaptability of the Church. As a theologian, he recognized her immutability in the faith. His idea of a pastoral council may be outlined as follows. The adaptability of the Church ad intra means inner renewal. Ad extra means due consideration of the situation and demands of the day. Both, however, on the basis of the unchanging traditional faith, true to the sacred principles on which she, the Church, is founded, and to the immutable teaching which the Divine Founder had entrusted to her. This is precisely the meaning of the well-known slogan, Aggiornamento. 
The reason for it was to bring the people closer to, quote, the sacred patrimony of tradition more efficaciously considering the new living conditions and social structures, end quote. For this purpose, John XXIII convoked the council. A special desire of the Pope was an ecumenical agreement, yet even here the truth of the faith was the norm. What counted was, quote, to come closer to the unity in truth willed by Christ, end quote. By this pastoral objective, the Pope had assigned to the council a highly practical mission, but without clearly defined boundaries. The difficulties first crystallized in the course of the debates. The Pope conceived a living, up-to-date, and relevant church on the basis of immutable teaching. He never dreamed of founding another church. The notion of a pastoral council gave rise to the idea that the church's external structures could be readily adapted to the modern world, while leaving her immutable teaching intact. But it is a well-known fact that major changes in practice are the end result of novel thinking. And, on the other hand, that the introduction of a novel practice modifies thinking. That goes, mutatis mutandis, especially for the Church and her conciliar reforms. Every major novelty in the life of the Church is the end result of a new theological outlook. And, likewise, the introduction of a novel practice must gradually alter the traditional faith. Thus, the belief in the real presence in the Eucharist found its adequate expression in the Church's rite of worship. If one does away with this form of expression, the faith in the real presence likewise erodes by degrees. Accordingly, the Preconciliar Church's outlook towards the Protestant denominations and non-Christian religions flowed from the traditional Christology and ecclesiology. The post-conciliar outlook, which was demonstrated in Assisi for all to see, is the expression of a new theology. This novel practice likewise stirs up considerable repercussions for the faith of the entire people of God. Given the close connection between external structures and the immutable essence of the Church, the self-acclaimed pastoral council inevitably had to deal with the dogmatic foundation of a giornamento. The dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium covered the dogmatic aspect, while the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes covered the pastoral aspect. The idea of a pastoral council was unrealistic. The pastoral council became automatically a dogmatic one. Considering the delicate state of disarray among theologians at the time, the assumption that Catholic teaching would go unchallenged in the course of a purely pastoral council was a pious illusion. The wish of John the Twenty-Third, which was also fulfilled, namely a council which would condemn no errors and define no dogmas, should be viewed in this light. This is the first time in the history of the Church that an ecumenical council was known to have waived the complete deposit of its magisterial authority. We should keep that in mind in connection with the above-stated position of Yedin. The Pope's wish arose from his conception of a pastoral council, but this conception was not feasible under the circumstances, as the point of controversy was still fundamentally dogmatic. Bishops and theologians gladly and abundantly made use of the purported academic freedom of theological opinions in pastoral matters. To the idea of a pastoral council and the abstaining from dogmatic decisions was joined a third novelty in the history of the Church the father's choice of a, quote, pastoral language of the council. A pastoral language of the council appears fitting for a pastoral council, indeed, to be the adequate expression of a pastoral objective. 
it seems appropriate in order to reach the goals of aggiornamento more easily, since there was no room in Vatican II for a theologically more involved consideration of the essence of a pastoral council, we must then conclude the following. By the term pastoral language of the council was meant primarily nothing less than a universally understandable and relevant language. A council which wanted to place the true face of the church before the eyes of the whole world Lumen Gentium 1, 1, should also speak in a language which the whole world understands. The Church's novel interest in the modern world also required a novel language which was predisposed towards the ideas and thinking of the modern world. Many of the Council Fathers were well acquainted with the problem of a pastoral language of the Council, as they, in their pastoral function, needed to bring rather abstract concepts down to earth in a language commonly understood. Everywhere one could hear the phrase, quote, to express old truths with new words. Naturally, with words which are familiar to the people of the 20th century. It is a bold venture to summarize the role which the Council played in the unprecedented theological dogmatic revolution inside the Church. We must limit ourselves to the pastoral overall conception of the Council. Number one, the idea of a pastoral Council, although finally the dogmatic foundation was at stake. Number two, the abandonment of the full weight of magisterial authority although resolute clarity in questions of faith was imperative. Number three, the pastoral language of the Council, although the presentation of revealed truths demanded extreme conceptual precision. In this pastoral trilogy of the conception of the Council, which, in the light of the Council's actual outcome, seems pure fantasy, the pastoral language plays a major role in the formulation of the council documents. Number 4. Pastoral Language and the secular problem of understanding. To understand the problem of a pastoral council, one must examine the problem of a pastoral language of the council. John Paul II, as a man of the council, speaks a pastoral language of the council, naturally in his own style and with a particular force of expression. Thus, to understand the documents of the Council and the Pope's commentary on them, one must first examine their common language. The language dilemma awaited the Fathers unpretentiously at the entrance to the Council. Here, they could display ad limina their status as relevant and up-to-date. They stood before the alternative. Should the Council speak in the traditional technical language of theology, and that was naturally the classical language of scholasticism, or in a new language which is more generally understandable? The Fathers promptly discarded the academic scholastic terminology, notwithstanding its preeminent usage in magisterial documents for centuries, and preferred the pastoral language of the Council. Of course, it is possible to express the time-honored faith of the Church in a pastoral language and thus to bring it closer to modern man. By adopting such pastoral language for an ecumenical council, however, Vatican II itself would have to take and pass a test, a truly historical precedent. Whether Vatican II passed the test fully or not is an open question. An objective study of the Council documents will show that it succeeded remotely, and only remotely, in clothing the old truths unpretentiously in a new, dynamic, historically based biblical language, and in producing valuable results of theological workmanship. The language experiment, however, 
could only succeed because the vast majority of the Council Fathers stood on the firm ground of a well-defined traditional theology, and hence were capable of keeping the pastoral language under control. For the same reason, the more accurate interpretation of the Council documents, as the majority of the Fathers intended, can be ascertained even today only on the basis of traditional doctrine and church teaching. One cannot deny, however, that the pastoral language is frequently used at the expense of dogmatic precision and clarity, that by a pastoral language the continuity with tradition can be easily blurred, and that, in the final analysis, one can only determine the exact meaning of the statements with the help of traditional notions. Further, one must admit that the incorporation of a theological notion in the, quote, Catholic system, John Henry Cardinal Newman, which was established by the painstaking efforts of theologians over the centuries and expounded through numerous magisterial decisions, becomes much more difficult. A theology and church faithful to tradition cannot do without the stability and continuity of clearly expressed ideas, much less an ecumenical council. Due to its teaching authority, it provides in its documents a theological foundation for the entire church. One might then ask whether the council documents, written in a pastoral language, which as such deviates from the Catholic system of church teaching, and whose continuity with tradition requires vindication by many of laborious and subtle distinctions, does not already sow the seeds of a break with tradition. Furthermore, one must agree that the scope of the accessibility and relevance of the pastoral language of the Council was confined to the Western Hemisphere, and that the intercultural aspect of the language problem was thus overlooked. The teaching of the Church, and hence the Council documents, must be understood in all languages and cultures. It is well known that precisely the language and conceptual clarity of St. Thomas is particularly well understood in the Far East and India, as opposed to the modern jargon. It may be asked whether the abandonment of the traditional language of the Church and theology, which had a universal character, did not pave the way for a pluralism of cultural theologies. Footnote the most impressive example of the capability of receiving and further developing Occidental science and philosophy is Japan, which first opened itself to the West in 1868. Ultimately, we may raise the question, why did an ecumenical council, which wanted to lay down the theological basis for a church comprising then 700 million faithful, absolutely have to compose its extensive documents, which moreover, for the most, would only be studied by theologians, in a down-to-earth and relevant language, and thereby would leave the Church faced with the problem of whether to integrate the Council texts into their dogmatic tradition, or to abandon it completely. The latter would be a new beginning on unsteady ground. The pastoral language of the Council was regarded as merely a pastoral question. In reality, it involved a completely different problem in a completely different dimension, namely, the secular problem of understanding in the framework of the modern view of history and outlook on life which has occupied our Western mentality as a whole and which has repeatedly plagued Catholic theology since the 19th century. This modern view, which the Church rejected in the form of modernism, urgently distresses today's theologians as a hermeneutical problem. The clarification of this angle, unsolved problem of the century, would have warranted a council. A pastoral council, however, would make light of such a problem. Through the abandonment by the council fathers of the scholastic language, the floodgates were practically, quasi-officially, opened, virtually by tacit agreement, for a new theology 
and that at a point in time when the language problem affected the whole of Catholic theology. The leading theologians naturally saw that the language would affect the nature, indeed the very substance, of the theology and the faith. For scholastic terminology was inseparable from scholastic philosophy and theology, and thus intimately bound up with the dogmatic tradition of the Church. The abandonment by the Council Fathers of the scholastic language entailed, in reality, the discarding of scholastic theology, and hence a divorce between the philosophia perennis and the faith after centuries of being united. That was exactly the aim of the leading theologians of the Council, although they themselves must have realized that the philosophia perennis meant the entire tradition of Western Christian philosophy. The father's abandonment of scholastic language was for them the conditio sine qua non for the establishment of a break with the former dogmatic theology in order to introduce the new theology after the dissolution and final surrender of the old. The men of the new theology were, for example, convinced that along with the completely outdated physics of the ancients, their metaphysics must be likewise outdated. Further, they maintained that modern theology wedded to ancient metaphysics is no longer based on reality, and moreover has lost all relevance in face of the modern view of history and outlook on life. Theology professors, who as students had easily understood the creeds of the old church and the traditional dogmatic theology, found everything suddenly unintelligible. Footnote a paradigm of this mentality is the lecture of Freiburg professor Bernhard Welte at the Salzburg University Seminar, July 23rd to August 6th, 1972, on the crisis of dogmatic statements on Christ. Welte began by saying that the definitive dogmatic statements on Jesus Christ, his divine and human nature, his substantial unity with the Father, as they were defined in the first four councils of late antiquity and handed down for more than a thousand years with the same words as before, today have fallen into a serious crisis. Velta named two reasons. Through modern historical critical biblical science exegesis, the fundamental discrepancy between biblical and late ancient Hellenistic thinking is made clear. Add to this that the modern mental framework can no longer grasp the main ideas of former times, such as essence and nature. These concepts today have lost their original sense. The very language of the ancient statements on Christ is no longer understood today. The concept of essence is in fact the overall main idea by which, in the form of Jesus, the relation of the Son to the Father is expressed as an abstract formula. We had to recognize, however, the relative character of such formulas, which depend on circumstances. They are products of Alexandrian philosophy of the second and third centuries after Christ and conform to a formally prevailing direction of inquiry. The concept of event can be viewed as the leading concept of the biblical understanding of Jesus, which likewise reflects the modern mental framework. We are witnessing a historically decisive transformation which happened in late antiquity and seems to be happening again in our day. On the question of whether in such cases the link with tradition be broken, Velta answered, quote, In the form of expression, yes. In the essentials of the faith, no. End quote. Der Katholische Gedanke, Regensburg, 28th Year of Issue, Volume 28, 1972, page 136. End footnote. The extremity of the break with tradition is made clear by the dictum of a highly reputable professor of dogmatic theology who, from his chair, counseled his students to burn their obsolete preconciliar manuals in good conscience. In this unprecedented semantic revolution and historically decisive transformation, 
the entire traditional dogmatic theology was easily swept away. After clearing the foundation, the structure of a new theology could be continued uninterrupted at the wayside of the pastoral language of the council. For the promoters of the new theology, the watchword aggiornamento meant the definitive opening of the church to modern thought in order to construct a completely different theology, from which the birth of a novel, relevant church was to follow. Footnote. How such a new church from below, from the Christian Marxist spirit, looks in the end, see Leonardo Boff, Ecclesiogenesis, Petropolis, 1977. End footnote. Never before in the history of the church has an ecumenical council taken a stand on a question which concerned the foundation of the entire dogmatic tradition of the church, as Vatican II has done. Never before was a papal encyclical allowed, after a mere 15 years, to be so rapidly and so completely disavowed by the very people whom it condemned as humani generis. 1950, in which Pius XII defended the Philosophia Perennis, demanded adherence to the dogmatic language of the Church, and warned against the surrender of the Catholic faith to the philosophical notions marked by the spirit of the times. With great clarity, Pius XII analyzed the intellectual situation before the Council and pointed out the dangers of a new theology. Quote, While they despise this philosophy, they extol others, whether ancient or modern, whether of the peoples of the Orient or of the Occident, so that they seem to insinuate that any philosophy or belief, with certain additions, if need be, as corrections or supplements, can be reconciled with Catholic dogma. No Catholic can doubt that this is quite false, especially since it involves those fictions which they call immanence, or idealism, or materialism, whether historic, or dialectic, or even existentialism, whether professing atheism, or at least rejecting the value of metaphysical reasoning." End quote. Exponents of the New Theology were made cardinals, a public rehabilitation. The outward appearance of the new theology is multifaceted, but basically quite simple, so one can summarize the various forms under the same name. The rejection of traditional theology is common to all the forms. That means the dismissal of the Catholic system of John Henry Cardinal Newman, which is promptly replaced by the most varied new attempts of the individual theologians. Thereby arose the modern pluralism of theologies in the Catholic Church. The general guiding principle of the new theology is the attractively simple idea, a new theology in the domain of the scientific method and the modern view of history and outlook on life. The new theology means an entirely new beginning for the Catholic Church, a, quote, historically decisive transformation, end quote, Bernhard Welte. That idea was, however, by no means new. It only picked up on what scholastic theology and the magisterium, in its struggle against modernism, had successfully hindered, but which had for a long time already proved to be a character trait of Protestant theology. Revelation and faith were adapted to the philosophical intellectual movements of the times, that is, practically abandoned. One could not create the, quote, modern view of history and outlook on life. It was already there. One only had to adopt it. It comprised broadly the very systems which Pius XII had rejected as untenable in Umani Generis. Immanentism, existentialism, idealism, and historical and dialectical materialism. 
from the choice of that kind of system resulted, on a wider scale, the attack of the new theology on the traditional theology of the church decried as dismembered with its supposedly unrealistic dualism. Its only position was thus an open or hidden monism in which the supernatural order became fused with the natural, resulting in a sublime unity no longer to be cut asunder. Existential idealism denied objective metaphysics and incorporated each real object, including the objective truth of revelation, into the vast universe of its subjectivity and historical relevance. In the wake of the Frankfurt neo-Marxist school, such a political theology was able to evolve in favor of the following subversive tenets. There is only one reality, namely the historical. The radical distinctions in traditional theology of transcendence and immanence nature and grace, church and world, salvation history and world history, the present life and the life to come, time and eternity, creation and redemption, profane and sacred, natural and supernatural revelation, are dismissed as inadmissible dualism and hallucinations. The faith of the church dissolves into pure history. The result of the new theological principle is the pluralism of countless theologies, which, through enculturated theologies of every culture and religion, are constantly multiplying. The encyclical Humani Generis is forgotten or ignored. Nothing demonstrates the complete abandonment of the Catholic system of John Henry Cardinal Newman more clearly than the complicated pluralism in current theology. A significant product of this development is the series of publications of a missionary society entitled The Myth of Christian Uniqueness Toward a Pluralistic Theology of Religions. It sounds like a theological echo of Assisi when it says, quote, A new Christian theology of religions is taking shape, moving beyond the traditional models of exclusivism that says Christianity is the only true religion, and inclusivism, Christianity is the best religion, and toward a new pluralistic view that recognizes the possibility of many religious paths, all of them valid. A widely divergent group of Christian theologians, Protestant and Catholic, female and male, East and West, First and Third World explore genuinely new attitudes toward other religious believers and traditions." End quote. The Second Vatican Council should be viewed in the context of this development in theology and in the Church. In this context, the problem of a pastoral council becomes apparent. Likewise, the problem of abandoning defined articles of faith for the sake of pastoral language. In this context, we may restate the question critically. Did the Council really succeed in presenting intact and with unmistakable clarity the immutable teaching of the Church in pastoral language, or could the new theology have infiltrated the Council documents? Number 5. Assisi, the Shibboleth for the Correct Understanding of the Council. Translator's footnote, Shibboleth, a saying distinctive of a particular group, see Judges 12.5. Shibboleth, ear of corn, was the password for the Gileadites, by the pronunciation of which they could recognize the Ephraimites. The new theology was certainly not capable of modifying the Council documents in their entirety according to their modern standards, 
But when, for example, Joseph Ratzinger characterizes the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes, in connection with the texts about religious liberty and the world religions, as a sort of, quote, counter syllabus, that means that the new theology has exercised considerable influence on the dogmatic elements of various council documents. If the Pope of the Council himself, Paul VI, must observe to his horror that the, quote, smoke of Satan has penetrated the temple of God through some opening, end quote, then one must ask if this opening is not to be sought in certain characteristics of the council itself. Through the eye of the needle of pastoral language, the anti-spirit of the council could force its way into the documents unnoticed, at least by way of loopholes and later interpretations. Through the abandonment of the philosophia perennis and scholastic terminology, the texts were open to many different interpretations. Through a pastoral language of the council, the entire foundation was porous. Unintended, alien ideas can penetrate not only through a large opening, but also through smaller passages. The promoters of the new theology realized that, in a pastoral council, only a new theology could produce a new church. It was only a question of development. Therefore, they were satisfied with the abandonment of the language of tradition. They needed only to build into the texts certain loaded phrases which would summarize the Council's message and get it across to modern man as the beginning of a theological development and a renewal of the Church. Footnote. Karl Rahner, quote, the council is thus the council at the beginning of a new age, and thus the beginning of a beginning, which must be continued by the post-conciliar church, and thus the council is a challenge for today's Christian. End quote. The exchange of letters between Rahner and Vorgrimmler, published in Orientierung, is informative. End footnote. The reasons for the turbulent post-conciliar development in the Church and theology can also be sought in a certain cryptic, ambivalent character of the Council's thinking. From the obscure mingling of contrary endeavors and aims of the Council, namely of the traditional and the new theology, a tension which would remain unresolved since the Council rejected anathemas and dogmatic definitions, a vehement theological controversy had to break out immediately, which left its mark on the entire post-conciliar era, and brought the Assisi worship to a head in the fermentation process of Accomodata Renovatio Ecclesiae. The case for the renewal of the Church was supported by appealing to the spirit of the Council. The vehemence of this controversy is an indication of the depth of this unprecedented upheaval which touches not only pastoral matters, but also the very substance of the faith of the Church. Conservatives and progressives alike appeal in letter and spirit to the same Council. The conservatives affirm the continuity of the Council and its teaching with tradition while the progressives emphasize the Council's absolute novelties and confirm their break with tradition. The prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith took part in the controversy and tried to clarify. In his view, nothing less than the identity of the Catholic Church was at stake. He rejected the distinctions between a pre- and post-conciliar Church, although not a few contemporaries perceive the depth of the change in that light. The prefect defended the dogmatic integrity of the Council and its continuity with tradition. With his diagnosis of the Council, he felt obliged, however, to differentiate between the true Council and the anti-spirit of the Council. The true Council is identical with the approved council documents. If this be true, 
the worldwide spread of the anti-spirit of the council cannot be traced back to the council documents themselves. But the anti-spirit of the council has arguments too. It can likewise produce council texts in support of its understanding of the council. One interpretation of the council stands against the other. In former times, one carried out the discernment of spirits in light of the councils. Today we must carry out the discernment of spirits of the council. Faced with the practical realization of conciliar renewal, not a few among the faithful find themselves for the first time in history in a crucial situation, feeling obliged to test the spirits of an ecumenical council if they are of God or not. 1 John 4, 1. That test was conducted most recently in face of the interreligious prayer service at Assisi. Never before in the history of the church has a quarrel about what an ecumenical council really said and willed so upset the life of the church as after Vatican II. The controversy over the correct understanding of the council became the striking characteristic of the post-conciliar era. In this unprecedented controversy, Pope John Paul II makes not Holy Scripture, but rather Assisi, the shibboleth for the correct understanding of the council. Chapter 3 A Sign of Contradiction A Meditation on Christ Important milestones on the theological journey of John Paul II to Assisi are the retreat conferences which Karl Wojtyla in 1976 preached to Pope Paul VI and a few of his most intimate colleagues in the Vatican. They were published under the title of the original Italian work, Segno di Contradizione Meditazioni, Milan, 1977. The English translation, Sign of Contradiction, appeared in 1979 from the Seberg Press, thus after the election of Karl Wojtyla as Pope. The recommendation for the book makes an accurate observation. Quote, here one gets to know the new pope most intimately. End quote. Theology and spirituality are so mutually related that they make up a unified body. The retreat conferences are no mere pious exhortations, but an extensive theological and spiritual meditation which opens the very essence of religion, the encounter between God and man, and then strives to realize this encounter, or, as the Cardinal puts it, quote, to get as close as possible to God and to be penetrated by his Spirit, end quote. The professor and Archbishop of Krakow thus proved himself a man of Vatican II in those retreat conferences. The starting point and basis of his entire theology is Vatican II. The main sources of the reflection on Christ are the Council documents. From these he constructs a doctrinal system on salvation and redemption, which constitutes especially the doctrinal foundation of his, quote, theology of religions. The mention of a theology of religions should nevertheless be taken with a grain of salt. Cardinal Wojtyla has constructed neither a systematic presentation of his theology nor a particular theology of religions. Rather, he has expounded a theological position from the Council documents, which developed in the course of time with increasing clarity and was finally presented before the world at the World Day of Prayer of Religions. Number 1 the journey of the human spirit to God. In the introduction to the retreat, in imitation of St. Augustine, the Cardinal describes the, quote, nature and meaning of the retreat, end quote. 
noveri me, may I know myself, in connection with the noverim te, may I know thee. The connection, God and man, the center of the Christian religion, appears at once as the encounter between God and humanity on a universal horizon. He says, quote, Humanity has a part to play by virtue of the principle of exchange, a wonderful exchange that is possible only between man and God, because an exchange of God for man did once take place. Admirabile commercium. End quote. Liturgy of the Hours. From this view, the cardinal opens the retreat with an interreligious meditation, with a form of Theologia Naturalis Religionum, by which he prefaces his Theologia Revelata. Footnote. The traditional terms of Theologia Naturalis and Theologia Revelata are only used in the sense of a short analytical distinction in the matter. Cardinal Wojtyła himself did not use these terms. End footnote. A reflection on the God of all men, the God of infinite majesty, precedes the reflection on the God of the covenant and on Christ. Part 1.1 a Theologia Naturalis Religionum in Nuce, i.e., Natural Theology of Religions in a Nutshell. With a few strokes, Cardinal Wojtyła sketched an outline of the struggle of the human spirit with the problem of God in the course of history, and situated his own philosophical standpoint in the present discussion, which is introduced with the heading, quote, Existence and the Person. Finally, in the section with the significant heading, quote, The Language of Silence, he outlines the journey by which, in his view, quote, man goes beyond himself by reaching out towards God, end quote. We quote this important section entirely, which contains the cardinal's Theologia Naturalis Religionum in Nuce, the annotations should only serve to give a better understanding of the text quoted. Quote, the Itinerarium Mentis in Deum, Journey of the Human Spirit to God, emerges from the depths of created things and from a man's inmost being. The modern mentality, as it makes its way, finds its support in human experience, and an affirmation of the transcendence of the human person. Man goes beyond himself. Man must go beyond himself. The tragedy of atheistic humanism, so brilliantly analyzed by Father de Lubac, Atheisme sans de l'homme, Paris, 1969, is that it strips man of his transcendental character, destroying his ultimate significance as a person. Man goes beyond himself by reaching out towards God, and thus progresses beyond the limits imposed on him by created things, by space and time, by his own contingency. The transcendence of the person is closely bound up with the responsiveness to the one who himself is the touchstone for all our judgments concerning being, goodness, truth, and beauty. It is bound up with the responsiveness to the one who is nevertheless totally other, because he is infinite. The concept of infinity is not unknown to man. He makes use of it in his scientific work, in mathematics, for instance. So there certainly is room in him, in his intellectual understanding, for him who is infinite, the God of boundless majesty, the one to whom Holy Scripture and the Church bear witness, saying, Holy, 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 God of the universe, heaven and earth are full of your glory. This God is professed in his silence by the Trappist or the Camaldolite. It is to him that the desert Bedouin turns at his hour for prayer. 
and perhaps the Buddhist too, wrapped in contemplation as he purifies his thought, preparing the way to nirvana. God in his absolute transcendence, God who transcends absolutely the whole of creation, all that is visible and comprehensible. End lengthy quote. This Theologia Naturalis Religionum in Nuce makes three fundamental assertions about the journey of the human spirit to God. Firstly, man's journey to God emerges, quote, from a man's inmost being. This point of departure finds support in modern existentialism. Secondly, in striving after God, man surpasses himself. Thereby, he surmounts all obstacles established for him by creatures, by space and time, and even by his own contingency. This transcendence of the human person is in turn related to the, quote, infinite, which is, quote, the touchstone of all our judgments about being, the good, the true, and the beautiful, end quote. It is hence a question of, quote, inward transcendence, of the way to the transcendental in the sense of existentialist idealism. Thirdly, the infinite becomes rooted in the mind of man which is apt to receive the infinite God. But that means that the unlimited inner space of the human mind is the appropriate place for the encounter of the human soul with the, quote, God of infinite majesty. These statements on the natural condition of the human spirit culminate in a Theologia Naturalis Religionum in which they are applied to persons of different religions. There we find the spiritual basis of the Assisi event. The, quote, God of infinite majesty is the God which the Trappist, quote, in his silence, indeed professes as the triune God, whom the Muslim invokes as Allah, and who, for the Buddhist, prepares the way for self-redemption towards nirvana. The fundamental differences of these religions are no obstacle. These differences are ignored because they obviously play no major role in the transcendental encounter between God and man. For the, quote, God of infinite majesty is a God who, quote, in his absolute transcendence, also, quote, transcends absolutely the whole of creation, all that is visible and comprehensible, end quote. These remarks of the Cardinal express clearly his positive assessment of non-Christian religions as ways to salvation. On this account, we may restate such a central position more specifically. All religions are, of course, included in the realm of, quote, everything visible and comprehensible. Judaism, Christianity, Islam or Buddhism, with their historically tangible and mutually exclusive representations of God and ways of salvation. The members of the various religions, in spite of their differences, turn, allegedly, with success to the, quote, God of infinite majesty in his absolute transcendence, who in the end surpasses all differences. They may use different names for the transcendent absolute and take different roads to salvation, but all that remains in the sphere of the visible and comprehensible. Finally, the worship of all religions is directed to the, quote, God of infinite majesty, who in his absolute transcendence surpasses all historical religions. This God over and above all religions corresponds to the homo religiosus in the midst of all concrete historical religions. A member of any religion is capable, as man, in the innermost depths of his existence and on account of his personal transcendence of receiving the God of infinite majesty in the endless inner space of his mind. Such an encounter between the transcendent God and the transcendent human person likewise takes place in the sphere of 
transcendence, that is, in the sphere outside of, quote, space and time, outside of, quote, the whole of creation of all that is visible and comprehensible, and hence beyond all concrete historical religions. The encounter between God and man is thus one which surpasses ordinary consciousness and rational knowledge, an experience which comes to pass in the innermost depths of the human spirit on the transcendental basis of all reality. In a word, it is a mystical experience, that is, unio mystica. This understanding of the Cardinal's remarks is already indicated by the title of the entire section, quote, The Language of Silence. The language of silence is the language of mysticism. The above explanation is, moreover, directly confirmed by the following statements. During its first session, the Synod of Bishops considered, among other things, the problem of atheism. The monks of the contemplative orders had sent to the Synod a most characteristic letter expressing their understanding of the attitude of present-day atheists when they considered it in the light of their own experience, that is to say, as men of faith, prayer, and total dedication to God, but who, despite all that, are not exempt from darkness of the spirit and the senses. One of the paradoxes of the God of infinite majesty, the transcendent God. St. John of the Cross has left us a beautiful testimony to such an experience. Quote, to attain to this which you know not, you must pass through that which you know not. To attain to this which you possess not, you must pass through that which you possess not. To attain to this which you are not, you must pass through to that which you are not. End quote. The Cardinal makes a connection here between the position of the atheists, one might say the dark night of atheism, and the mystical experience of the dark night of the senses and of the spirit, described by John of the Cross. The aim in view is, perhaps, to reinforce the last council's position that atheists could attain salvation, Lumen Gentium No. 16. Moreover, the attempt to equate atheists and contemplatives is of prime importance. If the encounter between God and man in the extreme case of the atheists is shown as a possible transcendent experience, then all the more so for the homo religiosus, pure and simple, in any religion. The mystical tenets of St. John of the Cross constitute the bridge to the Cardinal's comments on the Church, which conclude the chapter on the, quote, God of infinite majesty. The Church of the living God gathers together all men who in one way or another share this marvelous transcendence of the human spirit, and all of them know that nobody except the God of infinite majesty can satisfy their deepest longings. See Gaudium et Space, number 41. This transcendence of the human person manifests itself in the prayer of faith but from time to time in profound silence too. This silence, which sometimes seems to separate man from God, is nonetheless a special manifestation of the vital bond linking God and the human spirit. The Church of our day has become particularly conscious of this truth, and it was in the light of this truth that the Church succeeded during the Second Vatican Council in redefining her own nature. Since all men ontologically participate in the, quote, marvelous transcendence of the human spirit, the, quote, Church of the Living God gathers together all humanity. The, quote, Church of the Living God and all humanity coincide radically in the innermost depths of the transcendent experience of God. The, quote, church of our day has become deeply, quote, conscious of this, quote, truth, and has, quote, in its light, 
based on Vatican II, newly defined, quote, her own nature. The new self-understanding of the Church of our day has reached its visible manifestation before all eyes in the interreligious prayer service at Assisi. The Theologia Naturalis Religionum already contains the philosophical basis for such an event. However, Assisi is more fully understood in light of the Cardinal's Theologia Revelata, namely his theological defense from the standpoint of Christian revelation. Before we go into this in detail, a few critical remarks about the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis Religionum are in order. Part 1.2 Critical Remarks The focal point of the Theologia Naturalis of Cardinal Wojtyla is the, quote, encounter between man and God, its characteristic the mystical existentialist view of the homo religiosus and the, quote, God of infinite majesty. Limited time and space do not permit a critical analysis of the philosophical expressions in the above-quoted text of the retreat conferences regarding the ontological constitution of man in the encounter with the God of infinite majesty. Footnote. That could only be conducted in a more complete study of the writings on philosophical ethics by Cardinal Wojtyla, for example, the Lublin Lectures. Love and Responsibility, Primacy of the Spirit, The Acting Person. Characteristic of all these essays is the lack of true ontology. End footnote. However, the point of departure of the subjective experience of existence coincides in the end with the mystical. That alone certainly means God can be radically, quote, experienced, by all men. The confusion of philosophy with mysticism has important precedents, not only in the Eastern but also in the Western spiritual world. One need only think of the Enneads of Plotinus, 203 to 269 AD, and Neoplatonism with its ramifications. For a deeper understanding of the learned Professor Karl Wojtyla, the influences of phenomenologist Max Scheller and mystic John of the Cross are informative. We can sketch the first basic principle of the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis as follows. On the basis of his existence, of his personal transcendence, and of his mind's imminent endless capacity, man as man is capable of receiving the infinite God. Contrary to this is the Church's teaching that grace, quoad substantiam, is a necessary prerequisite for the reception of God. The problem emerging here clearly at the outset of the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis is only apparently solved by this thesis of universal salvation. Granted, the thesis of the equivalence of nature and grace, the problem of the absolute gratuity of grace, would still remain. Likewise, its necessity in order to free man from original sin to save his soul, Denzinger Bandvat 811-813. The existentialist point of departure from being as existence, from within and from the inmost depths of man, evidently locks up the subject within himself, while excluding any ontological foundation for a theologia naturalis in a trans-subjective object. See St. Paul in Romans 1, 19, and the five ways of St. Thomas. Naturally, both are aware of proofs of God's existence from the inner voice of conscience. The Cardinal's second basic principle can be summarized as follows. The God whom man encounters is the God of infinite majesty, whom the Holy Scriptures and the Church recognize as thrice holy. 
However, a glance at the book of the prophet Isaiah 6.1 suffices to expose this error. The thrice holy God is no super God, to whom every man turns in like manner, whether Jew, Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist. He is no Deus Maior Deo, as a prototype for all religions, but the exact opposite. In Isaiah 6, Yahweh is precisely the God of the people of the covenant, who revealed himself in history as the one and true, therefore jealous, God. In the zeal of Yahweh for his unrivaled supremacy, the most personal revelation of his essence was brought to light. The God of biblical revelation is not inclined to divide his unique claim to respect and love with any divine power. His jealous holiness is bitterly intolerant. One can hardly claim, for the purposes of a Theologia Naturalis, to acknowledge the God whom the Holy Scripture and the Church profess on more tenuous grounds, nor can one misrepresent the God of historical revelation more grossly than has been attempted here by simply ignoring religious history such as it is. Instead, the God of historical revelation, a philosophical abstraction, emerges, and this, as such, is common to all men and religions. The total abstraction from history in the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis can be accomplished only through the constant recourse to inwardness, to the subjectivity and to mysticism. Thus, everything rests on the super-empirical point in the transcendental encounter or mystical union of man with God. The question as to whether one's religion leads to God on its own merits, therefore, becomes secondary, albeit implicitly answered in the affirmative, since Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists all attain the God of infinite majesty by the same token. The transcendental encounter, which comes to pass in the personal transcendence of man, and the absolute transcendence of an abstract God, and hence by definition beyond, quote, the whole of creation, space, and time, end quote, and beyond all things visible and comprehensible, escapes logically every philosophical judgment. Such an encounter between each individual and his God, hence the question whether a person is in the state of grace, is a matter of which God alone is judge. Vatican II has explicitly stated that God can lead even non-Christians who know not the true God along the way, which he alone knows, to faith. Therefore, he is impertinent who would penetrate that which is reserved to God alone, the inner sphere of his grace. The mystical way can be broadly summarized as follows. In modern theology, the religious feeling or the mystical experience of God is considered the primary basis of all religions. The high point of such an experience is the mystical experience of union or the unio mystica. The experience of union is an undisputed psychological reality and a religio-historically universal phenomenon. It can be realized not only in any Zen meditation, but also in purely secular training sessions. That means that the mystical experience of union amounts to a realization of the potential of the human psyche, but even then nothing certain can be said about the actual union of the human soul with the true God. Thus, in the Christian mystical tradition, the differences between true and false mysticism were always sharply defined. Footnote, especially St. John of the Cross, who emphatically stressed the necessity of a critical attitude towards the mystical experience. End footnote. The criteria for the authenticity of mystical experiences, which even the holy mystics were bound to observe, were the Catholic faith and the heroic striving for virtue. 
even if these criteria hold true for non-Christian mysticism to a minor extent, our evaluation in that domain should be all the more cautious. Cardinal Wojtyla associates the dark night of the atheists with the dark night of the spirit and the senses, according to St. John of the Cross. Yet he neglects an essential difference. In the dark night of the holy mystic, his faith has to overcome, as it were, its trial by fire, whereas faith is wanting in the atheist. The foundation of Christian existence is the faith, which is also the root of Christian mysticism. The thesis that the divine transcendence or the mystical experience of union can so easily account for the, quote, living union between God and the spirit of man is simply unfounded. The Cardinal's thesis, quote, the Church of the Living God gathers together all men who in one way or another share in this marvelous transcendence of the human spirit, end quote, leads immediately to the Theologia Revelata to the Cardinal's theology, strictly speaking. Since transcendence is an ontological determination of the human person, it follows that all men, the whole of humanity, belong to the, quote, Church of the Living God. Quote, the Church of our day has become particularly conscious of this truth. End quote. The Cardinal's following statement is dramatic. In light of this newly discovered quote, truth, surely not revelation, the Church has quote, redefined her own nature at the Second Vatican Council. The redefinition of the Church's nature is an act of fundamental dogmatic importance. It must be asked, is the redefinition of the Church's essence compatible with that preceding the Council? Is the, quote, Church of our day, which has visibly manifested her new essence in Assisi before everyone, still essentially the same as the Church of all time? The Theologia Naturalis Religionum coincides radically with the Theologia Revelata. There exists a mysterious unity of all men in the, quote, Church of the Living God, and the, quote, Church of our day, whose essence Vatican II has newly defined. If that be the case, then the Council's much-quoted statement that the Church is the, quote, universal sacrament of salvation, acquires a very special meaning. The Church becomes the visible sign of universal salvation. Then, the Church's mission would be simply to acquaint humanity with the mystery of its hidden Christian existence, and to make man fully conscious of his existential grandeur. Consciousness, then, would be the deciding factor. Faith, baptism, and the Church would have no major importance in salvation. Part 2 the Thesis of Universal Salvation, Axiom of Karl Wojtyla's Theology? Cardinal Wojtyla begins the meditation, quote, The Bridegroom is with you, with a key text of the Pastoral Constitution, Gaudium et Spes, number 10, in order firstly to outline from this text the Council's teaching on the Redemption, C under 2.1, which he then develops in metaphorical language in relation to Christ, the bridegroom of the church, of man and of all humanity, and this he does in an especially graphic and intimate manner. See under 2.2. We follow the structure of the meditation. Part 2.1. The Council's Teaching on Salvation in the Cardinal's Understanding. The Council text from Gaudium et Spes, number 10, runs as follows, quote, A. 
The church believes that Christ, who died and was raised up for all, can show man the way and strengthen him through the Spirit in order to be worthy of his destiny. Nor is there any other name under heaven given among men by which they can be saved. The church likewise believes that the key, the center, and the purpose of the whole of man's history is to be found in its Lord and Master. She also maintains that beneath all that changes, there is much that is unchanging, much that has its ultimate foundation in Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Page 91, end quote. Cardinal Wojtyla comments on this text. Quote, B. Thus, the birth of the Church at the time of the messianic and redemptive death of Christ coincided with the birth of, quote, the new man. Whether or not man was aware of such a rebirth, and whether or not he accepted it, at that moment man's existence acquired a new dimension, very simply expressed by St. Paul as, quote, in Christ. See Romans 6.23, 839, 12.5, 15.17, 16.7, and other letters. End quote. Man exists, quote, in Christ, and he had so existed from the beginning in God's eternal plan. But it is by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection that this, quote, existence in Christ became historical fact with roots in time and space. Both texts, that of the Council and that of the Cardinal, are written in the style of, quote, pastoral language. We are therefore obliged in each case to render the theological statements with the help of precise notions of the Church's traditional teaching and dogmatic theology. An unpleasant yet revealing task, bearing in mind that certain dogmatic principles are involved, which, in the Catholic system, are completely clear and can be plainly expressed in a few sentences. On A, the Council text, the following statements are of immediate importance for our present discussion. With pastoral brevity, the Council proclaims the time-honored faith of the Church in a sole Redeemer, the universality of the divine will for salvation, the redemptive sacrifice of Christ, and the grace of salvation. These truths can be rendered in the traditional language of the Church as follows. God desires the eternal salvation of all men. Therefore, he grants sufficient grace for salvation to everyone, not only all just men, but even all men who are unbelievers through no fault of their own. Since there is only one Redeemer and one redemptive sacrifice, this grace of salvation is always the gratia Christi. See Denzinger, pages 318 and following, 827, 1096, 1294 and following, and 1376 and following. All of these dogmatic statements of the Church on the salvation of humanity refer to the objective universality of the divine work of redemption. On the subjective aspect of redemption, however, which in dogma is discussed under the heading, quote, the justification of the sinner, the Council, upon closer examination, makes no pronouncement. Translator's footnote Redemption, objectively considered, involves the question, what are the means of salvation? Subjectively considered, the question becomes more concrete, who then is saved? To whom are the means of salvation applied? In the paragraphs to follow, one must follow, one must constantly bear the above distinction in mind. For example, if a doctor discovers the cure for a mortal disease and makes it available to all those infected, then one can say that all the infected are objectively cured, but they are not subjectively cured until they take the remedy, i.e., until the cure is applied to each individual. End footnote. Since our present discussion on the Church's teaching involves a distinction of capital importance, which, however, today is by no means familiar to all, we present a brief summary of the dogmatic underlying principles. 
the God-man, Jesus Christ, has, through his vicarious sanctification and the merits of his redemption, accomplished the reconciliation of humanity with God. This objective universal redemption must, however, be received by and applied to each individual before subjective redemption comes to pass. The act of applying the fruits of the redemption to each man individually is called justification, dikaiosis, justificatio, or sanctification, agiasmos, sanctificatio, the fruit of redemption being the grace of Christ. The author of subjective redemption is the triune God. As a work of divine love, the communication of grace is attributed to the Holy Ghost, although it is effected by all three persons together. The subject of redemption, however, is not only God's work, but requires from men who are endowed with intelligence and freedom their free and voluntary cooperation. Denzinger Banfat, 799. In the cooperation between divine grace and human freedom lies the unfathomable mystery of the teaching on grace. Along the way to subjective redemption, God comes to man's aid not merely through an inner principle, the power of grace, but also through an outer principle, the efficacy of the church in her teaching, governing, and sanctifying, by her dispensing the grace of Christ in the sacraments. The end of subjective redemption is the eternal consummation in the beatific vision. On B, the Cardinal's Commentary In the above quoted words of the Pastoral Constitution, Cardinal Wojtyła construes the faith of the church as follows. In the moment of the redemptive death of Christ, the birth of the church takes place, and hence the birth of man. But from the association, redemptive death of Christ, birth of the church, birth of man, it follows that the birth of man includes the supernatural event of being born again, as well as the communion in the realm of existence in Christ. The new dimension of human existence means precisely this supernatural reality. The meaning is unmistakable. According to Cardinal Wojtyła, the birth of the church and the supernatural birth of man become one and the same. One can then no longer speak of being born again. One can hardly interpret the Cardinal's statements merely in the sense of the objective universality of the redemption. Yet we ask specifically, does the assertion of the simultaneous birth of the Church and of man mean that every man comes into existence as subjectively redeemed, as a child of God and joint heir with the Son of God? It would seem so, for the birth of man, in which he receives, quote, existence in Christ, occurs, quote, whether or not man was aware of such a rebirth and whether or not he accepted it. The Cardinal, by arranging his thoughts in major perspective, finally bases his thesis on God's universal plan of salvation. Thereby, he distinguishes between an eternal and a temporal aspect. According to the eternal plan of God, man exists, quote, from the beginning, thus from eternity, quote, in Christ. This eternal plan of salvation is realized in time, thus in history, through the work of redemption accomplished by Christ. For, quote, by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, this existence in Christ became historical fact with roots in time and space, end quote. Therefore, the supernatural birth of man would be like the saving death of Christ and the birth of the church, a, quote, historical fact, regardless of whether man, quote, knows this or not, whether he accepts this or not, end quote. Everything speaks in favor of the fact that the Cardinal teaches the objective and subjective universality of the redemption. 
It is a time-honored Catholic belief that the saving death of Christ was the moment of birth for the Church. It is, however, a novel belief that the birth of the Church was simultaneous with the supernatural birth of man, of every man, regardless of whether he knows it or not, whether he accepts it or not. It is a traditional Catholic belief that all the just, aborigine mundi, through the grace of God, belong somehow to the Church of Christ, the Savior of the world. It is, however, a modern belief that the birth of the Church automatically implies the supernatural birth of humanity. The theory of universal salvation means the Copernican revolution in modern theology, which was given standard form by Karl Rahner. If through the death and resurrection of Christ all men, aware or unaware, voluntarily or involuntarily, receive, quote, existence in Christ, then one may consider the non-Christian also as, quote, anonymous Christians, and non-Christian humanity as, quote, anonymous Christianity. Since we are here discussing a thesis which places the whole theology of the Church on a new foundation, we must ask ourselves if we have perhaps misunderstood the Cardinal due to his, quote, pastoral language of the Council. Thus the question, in his retreat conferences, does Cardinal Wojtyla formulate the thesis of the objective and subjective universality of salvation in a dogmatic, fully unmistakable terminology which excludes all ambiguity? For example, can we find a dogmatic, unequivocal assertion to the effect that all men through the cross of Christ are not only objectively redeemed, but also subjectively justified? The answer is given in a passage from the Retreat Conferences, which also discusses the realization of the plan of salvation in history. This is the point of history when all men are, so to speak, conceived afresh and follow a new course within God's plan, the plan prepared by the Father in the truth of the Word and in the gift of love. It is the point at which the history of mankind makes a fresh start, no longer dependent on human conditioning, if one may put it like that. This fresh starting point belongs in the divine order of things, in the divine perspective on man and the world. The finite human categories of time and space are almost completely secondary. All men, from the beginning of the world until its end, have been redeemed and justified, justificati, by Christ and his cross. Therefore, Cardinal Wojtyla defends the thesis that every man, quote, exists in Christ, or possesses, quote, existence in Christ, quote, and indeed according to God's eternal plan of salvation from the beginning, end quote, so that, quote, all men from the beginning of the world until its end have been redeemed and justified by Christ and his cross, end quote. Thus, all of humanity from the beginning of the world to its end would be in possession of the grace of salvation, thus has been effectively saved. Footnote. On the unity of all mankind in Christ, John Paul II expresses himself in the encyclical Solicitudo Rei Socialis. Quote, At that point, awareness of the common fatherhood of God, of the brotherhood of all in Christ, children in the Son, and of the presence of the living action of the Holy Spirit, will bring to our vision of the world a new criterion for interpreting it. End quote. L'Osservatore Romano, February 29, 1988. The salient point of the Cardinal's view of the history of salvation is that God's eternal plan of salvation and redemption, which encompasses all men, is already historical reality in a mysterious way. End footnote. Characteristic of this thesis is the striking fact that the subjective moments of salvation 
such as justification by faith or sanctification as the traditional teaching of the church explains it, are generally ignored. Translator's footnote, signification of the expression, quote, subjective moments of salvation, in order to be saved, one must freely accept the means of grace which God offers. That means in practice sincerely regretting one's sins, believing the truths revealed by God through his church, keeping God's commandments, receiving the sacraments of the church worthily in order to strive for holiness and perfection which befits a child of God. See 1 Corinthians 6.11 Quote, But you are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. End quote. End translator's footnote. The subjective moments of salvation, as the Church explains it, are generally ignored. Rather, they are played down, if not flatly denied. Thus, the salvation of man is accomplished regardless of, quote, whether the man knows this or not, whether he accepts it or not, end quote. Or, quote, the human categories of time and space are almost completely secondary, end quote. What becomes, then, of the severe gravity of one's responsibility before God, of the alternatives of eternal salvation or damnation which our moral conduct will decide, of genuine religious history as it is attested in the Gospels and in the history of the Church? Translator's footnote. For example, the martyrs who preferred to suffer the most cruel tortures rather than to renounce the one true faith. End footnote. We may then draw the conclusion. Cardinal Wojtyla defends the thesis of the objective and subjective universality of salvation, thus of universal salvation. The thesis of universal salvation coincides with the Theologia Naturalis Religionum of Cardinal Wojtyla, the, quote, wonderful transcendence of the human spirit, end quote, comes out of his Theologia Revelata as a hidden existence in Christ, which all men possess. This meditation on Christ is a milestone on the theological journey of John Paul II to Assisi. Besides the philosophical, it also contains the theological foundation for the common worship of all religions the thesis of universal salvation. In support of this thesis, which was never the teaching of the Church, Cardinal Wojtyla appeals to an official document of the Council. Is he authorized in doing so? The comparison of the Council text with the Cardinal's commentary serves as a classic example of the ambiguity of the pastoral language of the Council and the hermeneutics of Karl Wojtyla. Not a word about the birth of the Church, or of man, was even mentioned in the Council text. The Cardinal's commentary obviously goes beyond the wording of the Council text. The commentary even emphasizes the universality of subjective redemption, which, again, is not mentioned in the Council text. Though the pastoral language of the Council texts be open to loose interpretations, the commentary oversteps the borders drawn by the doctrine of the Church. The thesis of universal salvation has no substantial basis in the Council text as it stands. But the Archbishop of Krakow himself collaborated as a Council Father in drafting the pastoral constitution, and was completely familiar with the intentions of the authors. Thus, the question remains whether his interpretation perhaps brings to light the hidden meaning behind the Council text. That only serves to illustrate the confusion frequently caused by the pastoral language of the Council, which prevents a coherent interpretation of Council documents. Part 
part 2.2 Salvation expressed by the relations of head and body, bride and bridegroom, according to Karl Wojtyla. After Cardinal Wojtyla finishes expounding his understanding of salvation based on the council text Gaudium et Spes, number 10, he goes on to express it in terms of head and body, then in terms of bride and bridegroom, page 91. Indeed, the entire 11th chapter is entitled, The Bridegroom is with you, pages 91 to 100. He makes use of this biblical and traditionally rich graphic means of presentation in the context of the history of salvation in order to preach a meditation on the death and resurrection of Christ and on Pentecost, which he then associates with reflections on the sacraments of baptism, Eucharist, and matrimony. We will concentrate on the main point of the meditation, on the relationship of the bridegroom and bride. In the center of his remarks stands the bridal relationship of Christ to his church, the church as body and bride of Christ. Moreover, quote, Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. Christ is the bridegroom of the church, which is his bride, end quote. This traditional statement is theologically elaborated, then applied to salvation. Salvation is like a, quote, marriage bond, which Christ has effected with the church by his own death and resurrection. Consequently, the, quote, birth of the church at the moment of the redemptive death of Christ was simultaneous with, quote, her marriage to the divine bridegroom. Or, expressed differently, quote, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is an act of supreme love. Amor Dei usque ad contemptum sui, i.e., the love of God carried as far as contempt of self. It is in character with the love both of the Redeemer and of the Bridegroom. Page 94. The relation between the sacrifice of redemption and the spiritual nuptials is still more precisely defined. Quote, so the love of Christ the Bridegroom stems directly from the cross and the sacrifice. The Redeemer is the Bridegroom by virtue of being the Redeemer. He is able to bring his gift to the church precisely because he has already given himself in the sacrifice of his blood. End quote. Therefore, there is no essential difference between the love of the Redeemer and the love of the Bridegroom. Rather, they are correlative and essentially identical. Christ as Redeemer is also the Bridegroom. All of the above concerns as such the relationship of Christ, Redeemer and Bridegroom, to his redeemed Bride, the Church. So far, the texts are completely in line with Scripture and tradition. The bridal relationship of Christ to the Church is indeed a singular relationship. Yet, one notices a constant attempt to include all men in this intimate sphere. Thus, Cardinal Wojtyla, without the necessary theological distinctions, announces to the Church and to every man by the same token, i.e. to all mankind, quote, Behold, the Bridegroom is with you. And the Church heard it and understood Quote, Christ is with us, the bridegroom is with us, he is with the church, he is with every man, woman and child, he is with the entire human family, end quote. Or, quote, really there does seem to be a need to recall and repeat to the men of our day, the bridegroom is with you, his love for you is so great that he gave himself fully and irrevocably. Jesus wished us to inherit from him nothing less than the love of every single human being." End quote. Or, more to the point, in the first sentence of the following chapter, quote, As I said at the end of the last meditation, 
The love of Christ who loved the church and sacrificed himself for her, Ephesians 5.25, Galatians 2.20, the love of the bridegroom goes out to every human being, end quote. Our question runs, does the mystical image of the bridal relationship of Christ to his bride, the church, equally hold true for the relationship of Christ to every man and to all of humanity? If that be the case, then the remarks on the relationship of bride and bridegroom are a metaphorical expression of the thesis of universal salvation. Let us take a closer look at the last part of the above quoted text. The sentence summarizes the foregoing remarks and brings them to a head. In that way, the hidden meaning comes to light. It is clearly said that it is the love of Christ, i.e. of the bridegroom to his church, which, quote, goes out to every man. Consequently, the same bridal relationship which exists between Christ and his church also exists between Christ and all of humanity. This conclusion is the only logical consequence of the cardinal's thesis, namely that the redemptive death of Christ was not only the moment of the birth for the church, but also the moment of supernatural birth for each and every man, quote, regardless of whether he knows it or not, whether he accepts it or not, end quote. This interpretation is confirmed by numerous utterances of the Cardinal on the subject of Christ's relationship to every man. This relationship is described, for instance, as, quote, an indissoluble bond with the, quote, living God, which, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, quote, is with every man and all of humanity, end quote. The relationship of Christ to, quote, every human being is also portrayed as a, quote, complete definitive surrender and a, quote, union with every man. We may draw at least a tentative conclusion. Since Cardinal Wojtyla applies the image of the love of Christ, the love of a bridegroom for his bride, the church, to the relationship of Christ to all of humanity, the image becomes the metaphorical expression of the thesis of universal salvation. Although our interpretation seems obvious, nevertheless, we ask, can the Cardinal's remarks not also be understood differently, namely, in the sense of Holy Scripture and tradition? Part 2.3 Salvation expressed by the relation of head and body, bride and bridegroom, in Scripture and tradition. Scripture, the Fathers, and classical theology have repeatedly presented the mystery of the redemption of Christ through the images of head and body, of bride and bridegroom. A recent theological study, substantiated by tradition, can be found in the scholarly works of Matthias Josef Schäben. Though in his meditation Karl Wojtyla first discusses bridal mysticism, and only later the image of head and body, we propose now to render both aspects according to Schäben's comprehensive presentation. Let it suffice to stress only the crucial points. According to Schäben, the God incarnate is the head of all creation, particularly of mankind. Such is the position of Christ in relation to the universe and towards mankind. The designation head expresses the prominence of the God incarnate in the realm of creation to which he himself belongs. Mankind already is a united body on the basis of common descent from Adam. Christ, the second Adam, infinitely surpasses the first as God incarnate. 
by his entrance into the human race, the God-man has not only taken on his own human nature, but he has also adopted the entire human race, made it his own, united and associated himself with it. The phrase, Christ is the head of the human race, means therefore that the human race is, solely on the basis of the Incarnation, entirely assumed by the person of the Word. It is called his body, and, in a broader sense, even the mystical body of Christ. The incarnation of the Word as such means also the elevation and exaltation of the entire race. As head, the incarnate God raises the entire race to an immeasurable, incomprehensible height of dignity, of life, and activity. The union of Christ with the entire human race on the basis of the Incarnation alone, thus as head of the mystical body of Christ in the broad sense, must not be confused with the union of Christ with the Church, thus as head of the mystical body of Christ in the strict sense, i.e. on the basis of the redemptive sacrifice. The simple union of the head with every man and with all of humanity, which alone is accomplished through the Incarnation, is, however, a lifeless union from the point of view of subjective redemption or justification. It is only the material laying of the foundation, the alignment, and the prerequisite for the living union in the mystical body of Christ, the Church, through faith and baptism. The Church Fathers also presented the mystery of redemption in terms of nuptials. They portrayed the assumption of human nature by the Word as a wedding, and indeed understood it as a marriage not only with his own nature, but also with every human nature. Accordingly, Christ appears as the bridegroom of the whole of mankind, and mankind appears as the bride of the Son of God, solely on the basis of the Incarnation. They have, quote, become united in one flesh, end quote. There is, however, a distinction between this wedding in the broader sense, which comes about through the Incarnation alone, and the wedding in the strict sense of Christ as bridegroom with his bride, the Church. The wedding of the Son of God with the whole of mankind is only a virtual wedding, which makes sense only in relation to the formal wedding of Christ the Bridegroom with his Bride the Church. As Shaban puts it, the union with mankind, quote, is, as it were, a virtual wedding by which the Son of God could immediately shed his blood for human nature as for a bride already truly belonging to him, in order to make her pure and unstained, to make her capable of the holy bond with him, and then also nourish her with his own flesh and blood." End quote. The virtual wedding, which follows solely on the basis of the Incarnation, and without man's cooperation, however, by no means implies that man already partakes of the divine life. It means only the invitation of all mankind to the formal wedding of Christ the Bridegroom with his Bride, the Church. Only in the formal wedding, which takes place through man's free cooperation by faith and the reception of baptism, does man receive the application of the fruits of the redemption, participation in the divine life, and incorporation into the Church. In light of the foregoing, the graphic presentation of the mystery of the redemption by Cardinal Wojtyla poses a serious problem of interpretation. The Cardinal neglects theological distinctions which are indispensable even if one relies on images. By this means, he presents certain teachings as Catholic doctrine which, in fact, are not. So, we are obliged once more to subject the cardinal's statements 
to a critical examination in the light of church doctrine. Part 2.4 Critical Remarks Even if classical theology teaches the mystery of redemption through the images of the first and second Adam, of head and body, of bride and bridegroom, it still does not neglect the necessary fundamental distinctions between objective and subjective redemption. The theological terminology is consistent with these graphic descriptions, but still allows for distinctions. Even if the Incarnation is characterized as a wedding of the Word with every human nature and the whole of mankind solely on the basis of the Incarnation, characterized as the Bride of Christ, nevertheless the meaning remains clear. It is a question of a virtual wedding and a Bride of Christ in absolute need of redemption, and which is therefore still sinful since it's burdened by nature with original sin. The virtual wedding is ordered to the formal wedding. The bride as sinner is ordered to the bride of Christ, actually redeemed. Only the latter is the church. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, she is formally wed to her divine Redeemer and bridegroom. Decked out in the full bridal gown of her Redeemer's grace, she is also the chosen bride at the wedding feast of the Lamb. It is only in this bridal relationship that Christ directs his love as Savior and Bridegroom to his formally wedded bride, namely the Church. The Cardinal himself describes this unique marital relationship of Christ to the Church, page 93. But then he emphasizes that this bridal love of Christ for his bride, the Church, is given to every man, page 101. In this way, he radically extends the supernatural bridal relationship, as it exists between Christ and his Church, to every man, and thereby to all of humanity. He does not distinguish between the love of the Redeemer and Bridegroom of humanity and the love of the Redeemer and Bridegroom of the Church. On the contrary, he emphasizes their equivalence, and the gift is thus made to every man, thus to all of humanity. Humanity and the Church are apparently put on the same footing, the sponsa Christi. The cardinal statement namely that the redemptive love of Christ as the bridegroom of his church is, quote, given to every man, implies then, in a roundabout way, the thesis of universal salvation. In the entire presentation of the mystery of redemption through the images of head and body, bride and bridegroom, by Cardinal Wojtyla, one searches in vain for any theological distinction which would have clarified the various meanings of these images and avoided confusion between the dogma of the objective universality of salvation and the subjective gift of the fruits of the redemption to the individual in the process of justification as constantly expressed in classical theology. The complete neglect of the essential distinctions can only mean their tacit denial. This also holds for the use of the images of head and body, of bride and bridegroom, with no distinction between the strict and the broad sense. We therefore interpret correctly the exclamation, quote, The bridegroom is with you, and the affirmation, quote, He is with the church, he is with every man, woman, and child, and with the entire human family, end quote, if we understand them in the strict sense, as the expression of the thesis of universal salvation through the image of the mystical garment of bride and bridegroom. 
one might still be in doubt as to what the cardinal really means, since he, through the images of head and body, bride and bridegroom, and without further distinctions, takes up a mode of expression which is hardly compatible with traditional theology. We can dispel these doubts by merely following the inner logic of his own treatise. Cardinal Wojtyla begins his meditation, The Bridegroom is with you, with the thesis, the redemptive death of Christ was not only the birth of the church, but also the supernatural birth of man, every man, quote, regardless of whether the man knows this or not, whether he accepts it or not, end quote. He then specifies, quote, at that moment, man acquired a new dimension, very simply expressed by St. Paul as in Christ. See Romans 6.23, and other letters. That means that every man is objectively redeemed and subjectively justified. Thus, humanity, as well as the church, is the bride of Christ. Thus, Christ as the bridegroom of the church, is also the bridegroom of all mankind. Thus, the statement that the love of Christ as the Savior and bridegroom of the church goes out to every man expresses the thesis of universal salvation metaphorically. Doubtless, the New Testament and the entire tradition of the church teach that the Redeemer of the human race shed his blood for all, and that his redemptive love goes out to all mankind. But can one jump to the conclusion, without mentioning the necessity of faith and baptism for salvation, that the Savior of mankind extends his bridal love, which he shows to his bride the church, to every man without distinction as a gift? Whereas, the doctrine of the church requires faith and baptism for the communication of the gift of the fruits of redemption to the individual man in the process of justification. Doubtless, the love of the Redeemer, who gave himself fully and irrevocably, even to the death on the cross, goes out to all mankind, for all mankind is in a fallen state through original sin, and is radically in need of redemption, Romans 3, 9 to 20. But the universal redemptive love of Christ does not exempt anyone from obligations regarding the faith and the reception of baptism. See John 3, 16 to 21. In fact, both are required. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus requires faith for his healings and miracles. The universal redemptive love places man before a decision which is expressed unequivocally by the risen Lord's missionary mandate, quote, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe, however, will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Whoever disregards the gravity of the external issues involved in Christ's universal redemptive love does not acknowledge his Maker, into whose hands he is one day to fall. Further, he forgets that the redemption and God's economy of salvation depend on man's use of his freedom, for God's love is a gift which man can either accept or reject. Footnote. The Cardinal says as much in the Meditation on the Mystery of the Annunciation, on page 37, quote, In one sense, a very real sense, he waits to be chosen himself, because freedom is an essential prerequisite for loving God and giving oneself to God, end quote. Nevertheless, this reflection does not seem to concern the act of faith necessary for salvation, end footnote. Even Mary had to speak her fiat before she became the mother of the Lord. 
The acknowledgement that Christ is the Lord of all creation, as well as the central figure in the entire history of mankind, is by no means a new discovery of Vatican II and modern theology, which speaks of a, quote, cosmic Christ, and under this title propagates its theories of universal salvation. The Church acknowledged this truth from the beginning, quote, All things have been created through him, and for him, and he is before all creatures, and in him all things hold together. End quote. Again, quote, He is the head of his body, the church, he who is from the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. End quote. Colossians 1 16. The church has always taught the dependence of all creation on the Logos the drawing by Christ of all men to himself, and the objective universality of redemption. These dogmas were the objective foundation and basis of her universal mission, and, in turn, presupposed a further biblical truth of revelation, namely, the equally universal fallen state of man, every individual man and all mankind, Romans 3, 9 to 20. Therefore, our Lord entrusted his church specifically with a divine mission, namely, to teach, govern, and sanctify all nations in his name, thus to communicate the fruits of redemption to every man and to all nations. In a word, the church's sublime mission is, quote, the salvation of souls. Cardinal Wojtyla is completely in line with the Church's mission and with the Gospel, insofar as he highlights Christ's dominion over all creation, his prominent role in the entire history of the world, the all-embracing character of God's love. The Cardinal preaches this message solemnly to the entire Church and to all mankind, and rightly so. But. The failure to preach the entire truth is tantamount to the abandonment of the Church's divine mission, and a major part of the Gospel's teaching is precisely the universal slavery of sin, original and personal, into which the whole human race has fallen. Hence the necessity of conversion, faith, and baptism in order to be freed from the bondage of sin. The proclamation of a, quote, cosmic Christ, in the same sense of universal salvation, makes subjective salvation superfluous, i.e., the application of the fruits of redemption to each individual by the process of justification. Hence, it becomes pointless to emphasize the realities of baptism, the faith, and the church as absolutely necessary for salvation. But the subjective side of salvation, each and every man's existence in Christ, will once more be discussed by the Cardinal in the chapter entitled, Christ Fully Reveals Man to Himself. Our question is this, does this self-understanding of man also imply universal salvation? Part 3. From the Axiom of Universal Salvation to the Anthropocentric Understanding of Revelation. Part 3.1. Revelation According to a Council Text and the Commentary of Cardinal Wojtyla. Cardinal Wojtyla begins the meditation, quote, Christ fully reveals man to himself, after a short introduction again, with a key text from the Pastoral Constitution, Gaudium et Spes, number 22, on which he then comments. On the importance of this council text for the question of how others are saved, Joseph Ratzinger expressed the following view, quote, When one deals with the position of Vatican II on the question of how others are saved, 
one should henceforth preferably consult the text of Gaudium et Spes rather than the Constitution on the Church, whose somewhat unfortunate approach to the question has been slightly improved." End quote. This is exactly what Cardinal Wojtyła does. Number 22 of Gaudium et Spes is meant to support, as the central message of the Council, his thesis of the gift of Christ's bridal love to his bride, the Church, and thereby to every man. We propose, then, to quote in full the Cardinal's short introduction. A. The conciliar text from Gaudium et Spes b. and the adjoining commentary of Cardinal Wojtyła, c. with abbreviations of minor importance. a. The Cardinal's Introduction Quote, As I said at the end of the last meditation, the love of Christ, who loved the Church and sacrificed himself for her, the love of the Bridegroom, goes out to every human being, this truth is central to the Second Vatican Council's pastoral constitution on the Church in our day. One particular text that we must always take into account has provoked widespread comment and given rise to a great deal of very profound thought, both theological and pastoral. It is section 22 of the Constitution at the end of the first chapter entitled The Dignity of the Human Person. Let us read a passage from it. B. The conciliar text from Gaudium et Spes. Continue, quote, The fact is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word is light shed on the mystery of man. Adam, the first man, prefigured the man to come, Romans 5.14, Christ the Lord. Christ who is the new Adam, by revealing the mystery of the Father and his love, also reveals man to man himself, and makes his exalted vocation known to him. It is therefore no wonder that all the truths set out above flow from Christ and reach their highest form of expression in him. He is the image of the unseen God. Colossians 1.15 He is the perfect man who has restored to the children of Adam the likeness to God which was distorted at the very beginning by sin. Because he assumed human nature without in any way destroying it, human nature in us too has by that very fact been raised to a dignity that is sublime. By the Incarnation the Son of God united himself in some way with every man. He worked with human hands, he thought with a human mind. By being born of the Virgin Mary, he made himself truly one of us, like us in all things but sin. Number 22. C. The Commentary of Cardinal Wojtyła on this conciliar text. Continue quote. As the meaning of that text is very clear, there is no need to examine every word of it, but let us try to pick out what seems new and inspiring in it. First, the concept of the mystery of man, taken in conjunction with the fact of man's being revealed to man himself, clearly has something to say to two current schools of thought, mention of rationalism and empiricism. Second, by applying the category of mystery to man, the conciliar text makes clear the anthropological, even anthropocentric, character of the revelation offered to mankind in Christ. This revelation is centered on man. Christ, quote, fully reveals man to himself. But he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love. See John 17, 6. Third, this revelation is not theory or ideology. It consists in a fact, the fact that by his incarnation, the Son of God united himself with every man, became man himself, one of us, like us in all things but sin. 
Hebrews 4.15 Fourth Finally, the incarnation of the Son of God emphasizes the great dignity of human nature, and the mystery of redemption not only reveals the value of every human being, but also indicates the lengths to which the battle to save man's dignity must go. There we have the essentials of the Council's teaching, which is, therefore, the Church's teaching, on man and the mystery of man, a mystery which can be finely and fully explained in Christ alone. End lengthy quote. Part 3.2 Critical Remarks On Letter A, the Cardinal's Introduction In his short introduction, Cardinal Wojtyła says that the conciliar text to follow from the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes, number 22, supports his thesis that the love of Christ as the bridegroom of the Church goes out to all men. Vatican II has made this truth the focal point of the pastoral constitution. Hence, universal salvation is a central message of the Council. We must observe, however, that not a word about the love of a bridegroom is mentioned in the conciliar text. The Cardinal himself, in his own commentary on this text, does not return to this theme of bridegroom-bride. Perhaps he is trying to prove or verify the thesis of universal salvation, which constitutes the theological core of the mystical image of bride and bridegroom in his meditation by means of the council text. That is not the case either. Universal salvation is not proved at all, but is merely assumed. Thus, in his commentary on the council text, the Cardinal says no more about that part which is supposed to contain and prove his thesis. A travesty of interpretation which, however, is no isolated instance. On letter B, the conciliar text from Gaudium et Spes, number 22. Cardinal Wojtyła deems the written council text Gaudium et Spes, number 22, itself, quote, very clear. See letter C, his commentary. Perhaps very clear for the cardinal, but not so clear from the standpoint of classical theology. For instance, what does the conciliar text mean by the sentence, quote, He is the image of the unseen God, Colossians 1.15. He is the perfect man who has restored to the children of Adam the likeness to God, similitudinem, which was distorted, deformatum, at the very beginning by sin. End quote. According to biblical and theological language, the expression, quote, sons of Adam, means simply all mankind. Therefore, Christ, according to the text, restored all men to the likeness of God. Since the similitudo divina means the supernatural likeness of God, gratia gratum faciens, i.e. sanctifying grace, which Christ restored to the, quote, sons of Adam, the statement of the council could easily be understood in the sense of universal salvation, the supernatural likeness of God is allotted to all men. Translator's Footnote in the forthcoming pages, one should bear in mind the biblical passage referring to man's creation in the image and likeness of God, Genesis 1.26. In theology, image regards man's natural resemblance to God, i.e., in virtue of his spiritual soul, endowed with intelligence and free will. On the other hand, likeness regards man's supernatural resemblance to God, i.e. by the free gift of divine grace by which we are made children of God. See Romans 8.15, 
Galatians 4, 7. End footnote. On the other hand, the same sentence of the Council could be understood merely in the sense of the objective universality of salvation. That is surely how the overwhelming majority of Council Fathers understood it. The sentence could only be said to refer to universal salvation if the Council had thereby intended to teach not only the objective universality of the work of redemption, but also the subjective universality of the realization of redemption in every individual man, namely the application of the fruits of the redemption to all men. Various interpretations are possible. In addition to the confusion mentioned above, the Council text contains a distressing inaccuracy, see Ratzinger, which immediately becomes apparent when we examine it in the light of classical teaching. In the wake of St. Irenaeus, the scholastics developed the teaching on man's likeness to God as a classic paradigm for the teaching on grace, which, by using definite notions, presents the, quote, union of man with God as the fruit of redemption. According to Catholic teaching, the, quote, union of man with God means, quote, partaking of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. By that is meant a physical communion of man with God, expressed in scholastic terms, quote, this consists in an accidental unification which is accomplished by a created gift of God. This assimilates the soul to God and unifies it with him in a manner transcending all created powers. Man, who is by nature, as to his body, an incorporation of a divine idea, a vestigium dei, and as to his spirit, an image of the Divine Spirit, an imago Dei, becomes, by sanctifying grace, similitudo Dei, that is, becomes elevated to a higher supernatural grade of assimilation to God. End quote. Ludwig Ott, page 255. According to Catholic teaching, the sons of Adam, i.e. all men, lost the similitudo dei through original sin and the imago dei became wounded. By the application of the fruit of the redemption, which is accomplished through justification, the similitudo dei, gratia sanctificans, which man lost, is then restored to him, and the wounded imago dei is healed by its powers. Grazia medicinalis. Translator's footnote. Man's nature is wounded through original sin. His mind is darkened. His will is weakened. His passions enkindled to revolt against God's law. See Romans 7, 15-24. This wounded state of man's nature is also designated by the all-embracing term concupiscence, which remains in the soul even after baptism. In practice, that means our fallen human nature, which we have to struggle against every day with the help of God's grace, obtained by prayer, good works, and the sacraments. End footnote. On the other hand, the Council text says that Christ has restored the, quote, likeness to God, similitudo, which was distorted by the first sin, deformata, end quote, to all of the sons of Adam. In that case, the likeness of God was not lost due to the first sin, but only distorted by it. Joseph Ratzinger is quick to point out this lack of precision in his commentary on our Council text, 1968. There we read the following. Quote, the fact that the concept similitudo is used here to mean the restoration of the likeness of God in sinful man could well be a reminder of Irenaeus, 
who, by his distinction of imago and similitudo, anticipated the later distinctions of the natural and supernatural resemblance to God. And yet it seems peculiar that one portrays the similitudo only as deformata, whereas, according to classical teaching, the similitudo is lost and the imago only wounded. Such an expression, which in scholastic language one must here characterize as inexact, once again goes to show how little the council wanted to enter into these technical details of the scholastics, and how much it desired to express more basic views which everyone held in common." End quote. On this Ratzinger commentary, we must, however, remark that the confusion between imago and similitudo dei is not simply an inaccuracy which disregards, quote, scholastic language, but rather an all-out attack on a fundamental dogma of the Church, which forms the basis of the entire Catholic teaching on salvation, namely, man's biblically attested absolute need of divine grace for his salvation, since man is stained by original sin, a dogma which the Council of Trent clearly defined with all its implications. The alleged inaccuracy by scholastic standards is, in reality, an error against Catholic dogma and the floodgate for all kinds of theories of universal salvation. Continuation of Part 3.2 Critical Remarks Unlike Joseph Ratzinger, Cardinal Wojtyla finds the same council text, quote, very clear, and passes over the problem of similitudo de formata in his commentary. That is surprising, since man in the image and likeness of God holds a central position in the theology of Cardinal Wojtyla. A moment ago, we distinguished the various forms of man's resemblance to God from classical theology, showing how these forms serve as a paradigm for the Church's teaching on grace. A clear definition of the likeness of God in man from Cardinal Wojtyla would suffice to resolve the question of his thesis of universal salvation, and thus clarify the mysterious center of his theology once and for all. Hence our question, can one find in the numerous places in which Cardinal Wojtyla speaks of the likeness of God in man in pastoral council language, a definition which is so unmistakable that it conclusively brings out the meaning of this central point of his theology beyond all shadow of a doubt? No such clarification is found in the Cardinal's retreat conferences to Pope Paul VI and the men of the Curia, nor is it to be expected. Thus, we must look for a definitive answer to our question in other authoritative publications. In the first encyclical of John Paul II, Redemptor Ominis, 13, we find in a major section the twin concepts imago similitudo dei, in a context which leaves no doubt as to the exact sense of the statement and expresses the thesis of universal salvation with crystal clarity in, quote, scholastic language. Here it is. Quote, Accordingly, what is in question here is man in all his truth, in his full magnitude, we are not dealing with the abstract man, but the real, concrete, historical man. We are dealing with each man, for each one is included in the mystery of the redemption, and with each one Christ has united himself forever. Every man comes into the world through being conceived in his mother's womb and being born of his mother, 
and precisely on account of the mystery of the redemption, is entrusted to the solicitude of the church. Her solicitude is about the whole man and is focused on him in an altogether special manner. The object of her care is man in his unique, unrepeatable human reality, which keeps intact the image and likeness of God himself. The Council points out this very fact when, speaking of that likeness, it recalls that, quote, man is the only creature on earth that God willed for itself, end quote. Man, as willed by God, as chosen by him from eternity, and called, destined for grace and glory, this is each man, the most concrete man, the most real. This is man in all the fullness of the mystery in which he has become a sharer in Jesus Christ, the mystery in which each one of the four thousand million human beings living on our planet has become a sharer from the moment he is conceived beneath the heart of his mother." End quote. One could interpret and understand the entire text in conformity with church dogma until the sentence about the image, imago, and likeness, similitudo, of God, which are kept intact. This sentence, however, is the crux of the entire statement. One could easily say, from the standpoint of traditional teaching, that every, quote, concrete historical man, quote, is included in the mystery of the redemption, and united to Christ, quote, forever through this mystery, that every man, quote, precisely on account of the mystery of the redemption, is entrusted to the solicitude of the church." End quote. But one simply cannot say from this standpoint that, quote, in the unique, unrepeatable human reality of every, quote, real, concrete historical man, the image and likeness of God is kept intact. For the doctrine of original sin maintains with certainty the wounding of the imago and the loss of the similitudo dei in the concrete historical reality of every man. The redemption presupposes the condition of original sin in every man and is only removed through the justification of the sinner. The Council of Trent defined justification, quote, as being a translation from that state in which man is born a child of the first Adam to the state of grace and of the adoption of the sons, Romans 8.15, of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior, end quote, Denziger Banvat, 796. It is evident that the crucial statement from the text of the first encyclical, which runs, in the unique, unrepeatable reality of the individual man, the, quote, image and likeness of God are kept intact, end quote, is incompatible with Catholic doctrine. It stands in direct contradiction to the teaching of the Council of Trent on justification, by which man, quote, is born a child of the first Adam, and is translated to the state of grace, and the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam." End quote. The formulation of the inaugural encyclical, that in the individual unrepeatable reality of every man, the image and likeness of God is kept intact, integra permanet, goes far beyond the council text, which speaks of a similitudo deformata. But not only that, the statement that in every man, from the first moment of his conception, integra permanet imago et similitudo dei ipsius, gives rise to associations with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. We can thus be safe in concluding the statement that every man, from the first moment of his existence, quote, has intact the image and likeness of God, 
presents a clear definition of the thesis of universal salvation beyond all shadow of a doubt. From the standpoint of universal salvation, the entire traditional theological vocabulary undergoes a scarcely perceptible yet profound change of meaning. Here is only one example from the above quoted text of the encyclical. Every man, on account of the, quote, mystery of the redemption, is entrusted to the solicitude of the church, end quote. Such is the mind of the church since the New Testament. For the Savior of the human race shed his blood for all. But from the objective universality of redemption flows the missionary mandate of the church to teach all nations, i.e. make them obedient to the faith and lead them to baptism. Matthew 28, 18-20 Her mission was, and still is, to apply the fruits of the redemption, of the objectively accomplished universal redemption, to all men individually and collectively. If, however, every individual concrete historical man, from the first moment of his existence, is in supernatural communion with Christ forever, and inseparably united to him, regardless of whether he knows it or not, whether he accepts it or not, then he is entrusted to the solicitude of the church in a completely different sense. The concept of the church itself has then fundamentally changed. If the Son of God has, through his incarnation, united himself with every man forever and inseparably, and if the religious dimension of every man is the existence in Christ, then all humanity forms with and in Christ an organic unity, a natural supernatural organism. Then church and humanity coincide in the mystery of the redemption, and of man, then too, the dualism of nature and grace, of church and humanity, is basically eliminated. The Corpus Christi Mysticum as the Church and the Corpus Christi Mysticum as humanity are no longer distinguished in principle through their deepest essence, existence in Christ, but only in degree through their mode of expression. Translator's footnote. In other words, the Church and the world no longer differ by nature but only by degree as regards their existence in Christ. The practical question is then, which must conform to which? We allow the reader to answer. End footnote. Cardinal Wojtyla thus holds in his own individual style and method the well-known theory of anonymous Christians and anonymous Christendom. Continuation of Part 3.2 Critical Remarks Having ascertained that Cardinal Wojtyla holds the theory of universal salvation, we are also in a position to notice a change in the meaning in the traditional theological vocabulary used in his statements. The thesis of universal salvation supplies the key to the correct understanding of what is really meant. On letter C, the commentary of Cardinal Wojtyla on the conciliar text, the Cardinal in his commentary on the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, number 22, feels no need to go into an, quote, involved explanation of what he regards as a, quote, very clear council text nor does he furnish the promised arguments to prove that Vatican II viewed the bridal relationship of Christ to every man as the focal point of that constitution. Instead, he suddenly pursues an entirely different objective. He is concerned about the concept of revelation in the council text, 
which he believes must have an inner connection with the theme of the meditation, quote, Christ reveals man to man himself. Moreover, he proposes only to pick out special points in the council text, which appear, quote, new and inspiring. We will concentrate our interests on these new and inspiring points. Cardinal Wojtyla's interpretation of the council text is developed in four steps, on which we briefly comment. The first point. No one will contradict the Cardinal's observation that the Vatican II position according to which, quote, man is a mystery which became revealed in Christ, end quote, runs counter to rationalism or empiricism. But the Church has always held this position, and not just since the last council. Or does the expression, quote, revealed, in inverted commas, mean something new after all? Something, quote, new and inspiring in the council text? Second point. The council text should, in the cardinal's view, make clear the, quote, anthropological or even the anthropocentric character of revelation, end quote, in which he, quote, applies the concept of mystery to man, end quote. The words, quote, anthropological or even anthropocentric, end quote, do not appear in the council text. Cardinal Wojtyla speaks of an, quote, anthropological or anthropocentric character of revelation, end quote, as though it were a theological foregone conclusion. Joseph Ratzinger emphasizes, on the other hand, the Christocentric character of the same text. Footnote. In the commentary on Article 22, Volume 14, page 350, quote, one is indeed allowed to say that here, for the first time in a magisterial text, a new type for an entirely new Christocentric theology appears, which, in relation to Christ, ventures theology as anthropology, which thereby becomes for the first time radically theological, Christ as a man in the talk of God, disclosing the deepest unity of theology. End quote. The nature of this approach is outlined by Ratzinger in the following manner, quote, The humanity of all men is one. Since Christ took on one human nature, humanity is henceforth in each man Christocentrically defined. End quote. Page 350. These thoughts, however, have prevailed in Christocentric changes over to the anthropocentric through the thesis of universal salvation, as is the case with Cardinal Wojtyla. End footnote. Cardinal Wojtyla's reasons for the alleged anthropocentric character of revelation, supposedly emphasized in the council text, are by no means obvious. For, as is well known, Man is not the only subject which comes under the concept of mystery, but all truths of the Christian faith are rightly called mysteries. For instance, we speak of the mystery of the triune God, the Incarnation, original sin and redemption, the Church and the sacraments, justification and the last things. In that case, one must speak of a theocentric, Christocentric, hamartiocentric, soteriocentric, ecclesiocentric, dikaiocentric, or an eschatocentric character of revelation. Translator's footnote. The reader can figure out the meanings of these high-sounding words if he knows the Greek roots. Hamartia equals sin, soter equals savior, Ecclesia equals church, dikaios equals just, eskata equals last things, end footnote. The mystery of man evidently has an entirely exceptional significance in the theology of Cardinal Wojtyla. 
Furthermore, the Cardinal's argumentation is by no means self-evident. To apply the concept of mystery to man is one thing. To infer thereby the anthropocentric character of revelation is quite another. The explanation, quote, This revelation is centered on man. Christ reveals man to man himself, but he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love. See John 17, 6, end quote, is a sweeping statement which in no way flows from the Council text, yet which plainly manifests the Cardinal's understanding of the expression, quote, anthropocentric character of revelation. The next step of his commentary gives the final explanation. The third point. The sentence, quote, revelation is not a theory or ideology, end quote, presents no problems. Classical theology defines revelation, strictly speaking, as locutio dei ad homines, i.e., God's speaking to men. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. The definition of Cardinal Wojtyla, revelation consists in a fact, the fact that by his incarnation the Son of God united himself with every man, became man himself, one of us, quote, like us in all things but sin, Hebrews 4.15, is no faithful rendition of the council text which in fact qualifies the statement that the Son of God has united himself, quote, to a certain degree with every man. The council text can be understood without need of further comment in the sense of the fathers who present the incarnation of the Son of God as a union or wedding with the whole human race. However, by that is meant only a virtual wedding, to which the human race is invited by Christ. There is no question of the application of the fruits of the redemption or the communication of supernatural grace. The latter occurs only at the formal wedding of Christ with his bride, the Church, the communion of justified sinners. The Cardinal's definition cannot, however, be interpreted in the sense of the Fathers or of classical theology. We have pointed out that Cardinal Wojtyla understands the union of the Son of God with every man in the sense of universal salvation. Therefore, his definition, when compared with tradition, says something really new. It furnishes the key to an adequate understanding of his concept of revelation. See above, section 2.4. Since the New Testament... God revealing himself to man through the incarnation of his Son was theologically undisputed. Christ reveals God not only through his teaching and example, but he is, quote, in persona, the revelation of God per se, quote, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, end quote, John 1, 14. For that reason, one can speak of a Christocentric character of theocentric biblical revelation. Cardinal Wojtyla, however, says something else. His definition does not say, by revelation we mean that the Son of God became man, was born of the Virgin Mary, and revealed the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, and thus the glory of God. The Cardinal's definition of revelation is different, namely, that the Son of God, through his incarnation, united himself with every man, si e unito ad ogni uomo and as man became one of us, e diventato como uomo uno di noi. The clash with the biblical Joannine definition is evident. In the Cardinal's concept of revelation, the inner fact of the hidden union of the Son of God with every man corresponds to the outer fact, 
that the Son of God as man became one of us, and consequently as man, also presents our true human existence, or, quote, declares who we are. This shift of emphasis indicates in a subtle way the anthropocentric turning point. The union of the Son with every man through the Incarnation is the fundamental primary object in the concept of revelation as well as the key to an understanding of that anthropocentric character of revelation emphasized by the cardinal. Conclusion of Part 3.2 Critical Remarks The primary object of revelation can be clearly defined. We have shown that Cardinal Wojtyla understands the union of the Son of God with every man on the basis of the Incarnation as a real, supernatural, formal wedding, understood as a communication of existence in Christ. This union consequently produces an inner supernatural reality in every man, in whom indeed from the first moment of his existence, quote, the image and likeness of God is kept intact. The Cardinal calls this fact revelation. Consequently, he understands universal salvation as the main point of revelation. If revelation consists in the union of God with every man, then the concept of revelation is itself reciprocal. That is, the revelation of the Son of God in man is also the revelation of man in the Son of God. The salient point is, therefore, that man's existence in Christ is identical with the fullness and depth of human existence. That is precisely the sense of the cardinal's statement, quote, Christ reveals man to man himself. One could understand man's, quote, coming unto himself in and through Christ, or the self-understanding of man in Christ as a purely interior, subjective process of revelation. That is how Cardinal Wojtyla understands it, quote, Christ, the Redeemer of the world, is that one who, in a unique and unrepeatable way, penetrated the mystery of man and entered into his heart. End quote. And, quote, Christ works within human hearts, end quote, as well as through the Holy Spirit, working in all men. But in his above quoted commentary, he follows his main line of thought. There he says, quote, Christ fully reveals man to man himself, but he does this by revealing the Father and the Father's love. End quote. Footnote. In the Latin Council text, it runs, In ipsa revelazioni misterii patris. In the Italian translation, quote, Proprio rivelando il mistero del Padre. End quote. Cardinal Wojtyla, quote, Ma lo fa per mezzo della rivelazione del Padre, end quote. End footnote. The revelation of the Father and his love means, of course, the historical development begun by the teaching and example of Jesus. Consequently, for Cardinal Wojtyla, one must distinguish between an inner revelation on the basis of the Incarnation existing in every man, and an outer revelation, which was realized through the teaching and example of Jesus. The outer revelation is described as a means by which Christ enlightens man about the mystery of man, that is, about the ontic reality of existence in Christ present in every man and, in addition, reveals or makes him conscious of the fullness and depth of human existence. An outer revelation, understood as a means of resolving questions about the purpose of life, has, per se, also an anthropocentric character. 
The believing Christian has no advantage over the non-Christian as regards existence in Christ, which supposedly all men possess, but only as regards the knowledge revealed and established by Christ on the fullness and depth of human existence. The fourth point. Cardinal Wojtyla's thesis of universal salvation and anthropocentric concept of revelation makes scarcely visible changes in the traditional vocabulary compared to that which he now uses. We have already shown this change of meaning many times. A further example comes from the fourth point of his commentary with the sentence, quote, The incarnation of the Son of God emphasizes the great dignity of human nature, and the mystery of redemption not only reveals the value of every human being, but also indicates the lengths to which the battle to save man's dignity must go." End quote. At first glance, the sentence as it stands could have come from Matthias Josef Schäben. Upon second glance, the nominalistic way of expression strikes one as odd, and the clash with classical theology becomes apparent. The Cardinal says that the incarnation of the Son of God Quote, emphasizes the great dignity of human nature, end quote. Only emphasizes? This manner of expression reflects the thesis according to which the similitudo dei is kept directly intact in every man. Further, according to the cardinal, the, quote, mystery of the redemption reveals the value of every human being, end quote, only reveals? This sentence reflects the cardinal's thesis, according to which every man possesses, quote, existence in Christ as a fruit of the redemption. The mystery of the redemption signifies, however, something more and something deeper than only the, quote, revelation of the value of every human being. The nominalistic change of meaning achieved by the thesis of universal salvation is evident. Finally, Cardinal Wojtyla considers the four main points of his commentary on the Council text as a summary of the, quote, teaching of the Council and therefore the teaching of the Church about man and the mystery of man, end quote. The alleged central teaching of the Council about man and the mystery of man, is also the central approach of the theology of Karl Wojtyla. This coincidence explains the Cardinal's firm conviction that his theology is a faithful rendition of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. The fact that he as Pope defends this same theology unaltered has a major significance for the faith of the entire Catholic Church. Part 4. Henri de Lubac's Concept of Revelation in the Council Text and the Commentary of Karl Wojtyla. There exists an apparent similarity between the Christology and Ecclesiology of Karl Wojtyla and Henri de Lubac. De Lubac also claims that Christ has united himself with all mankind. All men have an organic bond with Christ. Church and mankind form an organic unity. Christians are, for de Lubac, only the, quote, declared members of the body of Christ. They have the missionary duty to make the non-Christians more familiar with that which they know not, namely Christianity. Our inquiry does not concern, however, the obvious similarities and possible differences in the theology of Karl Wojtyla and Henri de Lubac, but rather the concept of revelation. Our question is this. Are there, in the concept of revelation of Cardinal Wojtyla, agreements, similarities, or ties with Henri de Lubac? 
In order to reach a correct answer, it is fitting to boil down Cardinal Wojtyla's concept of revelation to a plain, simple formula. In the commentary of Cardinal Wojtyla on the above-quoted council text from Gaudium et Spes, number 22, we hear, quote, By applying the category of mystery to man, the conciliar text makes clear the anthropological, even anthropocentric, character of the revelation offered to mankind in Christ. This revelation is centered on man. Christ, quote, fully reveals man to himself, but he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love, end quote. John 17, 6. The following relation is, therefore, presented to us, quote, The mystery of man equals existence in Christ. Christ reveals or manifests man to man himself, and that happens by means of the revelation of the Father, or by which he reveals the Father. This fundamental relation in Cardinal Wojtyla's concept of revelation coincides remarkably with the statements of Henri de Lubac. In Henri de Lubac's Exegesis of Galatians 1.15 and following, he writes that St. Paul, in this letter, quote, uttered one of the newest and richest in meaning that has ever come out of a man, the day when, constrained to present his own apology to his beloved Galatians, to bring them back to the right path, he dictated these words, When he who had set me apart before I was born, and had called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son to me. Galatians 1, 15-6 End quote. The extraordinariness of these words consists, according to de Lubac, in that the Apostle says, quote, Not only to reveal his Son to me, to show or to call him forth in some vision so that I understand him objectively, but to reveal him in me. While he reveals the Father and he is revealed through him, Christ allows man to be completely revealed to himself by taking possession and hold of man, by penetrating the very core of his nature through and through, he forces him to enter into himself in order to discover previously unsuspected regions. Through Christ, the person stands in his maturity. Man projects forth definitively from the universe. End quote. Cardinal Siri rightly shows his astonishment at de Lubac's emphatic stress of Paul's quote, in me, and proceeds to unveil the statements of de Lubac. Quote, Father de Lubac says that Christ, in revealing the Father and in being revealed by him, finishes by revealing man to himself. What can be the meaning of that statement? Either Christ is only man, or man is divine. The conclusions may not be expressed so clearly. They nevertheless always determine that notion of the supernatural insofar as implied in human nature itself, and from there, without one's consciously desiring it, the way of basic anthropocentrism opens." End quote. It should now be clear that Cardinal Wojtyla also holds that human nature implies the supernatural. He speaks freely and easily of the anthropocentric character of revelation and of the mission of the Church. Down to the very words used, Henri de Lubac's concept of revelation coincides with that of Cardinal Wojtyla. We could scarcely go astray were we to suppose that the corresponding formulation in the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, goes back ultimately to Henri de Lubac. It should now be clear that Cardinal Wojtyla also holds that human nature implies the supernatural. He speaks freely and easily of the anthropocentric character of revelation and of the mission of the Church. Down to the very words used, Henri de Lubac's concept of revelation coincides with that of Cardinal Wojtyla. 
we could scarcely go astray were we to suppose that the corresponding formulation in the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, goes back ultimately to Henri de Lubac. The concept of revelation is the objective principle by which we come to know theology. Can we therefore classify the systems of Cardinal Wojtyla and Henri de Lubac as a new theology? This genus of theology was condemned by Pius XII in his encyclical Humani Generis, 1950. This verdict also affected Henri de Lubac as a prominent representative of the new theology. John Paul II made him a cardinal, and thereby also officially rehabilitated the new theology of Henri de Lubac. Chapter 4 Towards the New Theology of Cardinal Wojtyla A First Glance The so-called New Theology originated before Vatican II. It means the break with the Philosophia Perennis, thus with the entire tradition of classical theology, and in addition the attempt to combine theology and modern philosophical thought. The theology of Cardinal Wojtyla, former professor of philosophical ethics at Lublin University, has its theological roots not in the system of traditional theology, but in the approaches of phenomenology and existentialism. The cardinal even takes pains to reconcile Thomistic tradition with modern thought towards a more complete synthesis, in which he proceeds not from the ontological foundation of the Philosophia Perennis, but from the principles of modern philosophy, so that the classical philosophy and theology go under existentialist transformation. We can thus state at the outset, the theology of Cardinal Wojtyla, based on its language and philosophy, belongs to the genus of New Theology. This New Theology should be understood and interpreted according to its own way of thought. The main sources for this are selected texts from Vatican II on which the Cardinal elaborates according to his understanding of the Council. The retreat conferences are, by nature, no theological tracts, but meditazioni. It belongs neither to my theme, nor is it my intention to elicit from the meditations the entire theology of the author, which he himself has nowhere systematically presented. Here, we only attempt, on the basis of what we have thus far been able to prove, to give a comprehensive systematic overview, point by point, in order to make known Cardinal Wojtyla's general conception of theology against the background of classical theology. We can, thereby, only bring out the main points which pertain to our theme, the main principles which will lead us to Assisi. We further propose to give examples of the occurrence of such principles with a few significant passages. Since we intend to form an accurate idea of the Cardinal's new theology as such, its study is of paramount importance. Part 1. Before the Backdrop of Classical Theological Teaching on Human Knowledge Christianity is a revealed religion which, until Vatican II, claimed to be the sole possessor of the truth. As a revealed religion, Christianity has its final objective foundation in God's own message to mankind, who is both summoned and obliged to submit to the faith as the word of God. Theology is, as the term itself implies, the science of God. The material object of theology is primarily God, and secondarily created things insofar as they are related to God. 
In discussing the formal object, one must distinguish between natural and supernatural theology. Theologia Naturalis, which was established by Plato and which forms the high point of philosophy, is the scientific exposition of the truths about God insofar as they are known by the light of natural reason. Translator's footnote. The reader should not be too discouraged by these technical terms, which, when explained, are basically quite simple. The material object is what a science treats broadly speaking. The formal object is the particular aspects or point of view from which the science proceeds. For example, medicine, psychology, and ethics all have the same material object i.e. man, but the formal object is different in each case, i.e. the health of man's body, the operations of his soul, the morality of his actions, respectively. End footnote. Supernatural theology, Theologia Revelata, is the scientific presentation of the truths about God insofar as they are known through the light of divine revelation. The formal object of Theologia Naturalis is God as he can be known by natural reason from creation. The formal object of supernatural theology, hence theology properly speaking, is God as he is known through faith, through divine revelation. Classical theology is, per se, theocentric. Correspondingly, Catholic theology as a science has its objective principle of knowledge in supernatural revelation, fides quae creditur, and its subjective principle of knowledge in supernatural faith, fides qua creditur. Its classical expression is found in the, quote, Catholic system of John Henry Cardinal Newman. In this spiritual cosmos of traditional teaching, Every truth of the faith has its fixed place and exact meaning. Compared with the modern empirical sciences, theology is a science of faith sui generis. Translator's footnote. Principle of knowledge means either objectively what I know, e.g. a table, or subjectively that by which I know, e.g. the means of light. Thus, the distinction between the content of faith, i.e. the truths divinely revealed, and the act of faith, i.e. the supernatural light by which I believe these truths. End footnote. The break with the classical understanding of theology occurred with the arrival of the so-called new theology. The results of the break can be seen presently in the wide spectrum of pluralism in the modern, quote, prolific theologies. We have briefly drawn a sketch of classical theology, mainly in order to have a frame of reference for the presentation of the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla. Before the backdrop of traditional theology, the particulars of the Cardinal's theology shine forth more clearly. We will begin with an exposition of the most basic tenets of the Cardinals Theologia Naturalis and Revelata, followed by a treatment of the principles of knowledge in his theology, which, as in classical theology, are revelation and faith, but with a thoroughly different meaning. Part 2. The Way of All Flesh to the One God of All Religions With the help of church tradition and classical theology, we have duly described the statements of Cardinal Wojtyla on the, quote, journey of the human spirit to God as Theologia Naturalis, yet with certain reservations. 
The traditional Theologia Naturalis takes for granted the distinctions of natural and supernatural revelation, as well as natural reason and supernatural knowledge of God, faith. However, from the very beginning, any and every current of the new theology sought precisely to eliminate such, quote, antiquated scholastic dualism. That holds true as well for the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla. Our designation, Theologia Naturalis, should, therefore, only be understood as a conceptual label for the Cardinal's statements on, quote, the journey of the Spirit, but also the journey of all men to God, end quote. The discarding of scholastic distinctions signals not only the break with classical theology, but also means a grievous loss of scientific clarity in every current of the new theology. The dogmatic consequences are considerable, as we shall see. The traditional Theologia Naturalis draws its proof of legitimacy from the Bible. According to the testimony of Holy Scripture, man is capable of knowing the existence of God from creation, Wisdom 13, 1-9, Romans 1, 20, and from the inner voice of conscience, Romans 2, 14 and following. In the history of missions, this natural knowledge of God played a considerable role in the evaluation of non-Christian religions. Already the Apostle Paul in his discourse to Lystra and the Areopagites, Acts 14, 14-16, 17, 26 to 29, shows that God gives continual blessings to the heathen nations as well, that he is easy to find and is close to every one of us, quote, for in him we live, we move, and we have our being, end quote, Acts 17, 28. The church fathers reinforce the texts of Holy Scripture. The expression Theologia Naturalis is already found in St. Augustine, in connection with Varro. The thinking man reflects on the question of God and tries to answer it in virtue of his natural reason and through creation. The Church has recognized a Theologia Naturalis as the apex of philosophical thought ever since Christian antiquity. This tradition was furthered and deepened by scholasticism and classical theology until the basic tenets of the Theologia Naturalis were finally defined at Vatican I. Quote, if anyone should have said that the one true God, our Creator and our Lord, cannot be known with certitude by the things which have been made, by the natural light of human reason, let him be anathema. End quote. Denzinger Bonvat, 1806. It is clear by this definition how basic the scholastic distinction of natural and supernatural knowledge of God really is. The Theologia Naturalis is often used today by conservative theologians in their attempt to justify the prayer meeting of religions in Assisi. Cardinal Wojtyla chooses as the main point of departure of his Theologia Naturalis not external creation, but rather, quote, the depths of man, i.e., relying on modern philosophical currents, phenomenology, and existentialism. For an example of creation as the point of departure, let us consider the following text from Gaudium et Space, number 36, which the Cardinal quotes approvingly. Quote, Moreover, all believers, no matter what religion they profess, have always understood him to speak and make himself evident in the discourse of creatures. End quote. The text is reminiscent of the Apostle Paul, but with the following difference. In Romans 1.19 and following, the Apostle states his views on heathen idolatry. Quote, Seeing that what may be known about God is manifest to them, for God has manifested it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, 
his everlasting power also and divinity, being understood through the things that are made. St. Paul is not naively optimistic about the possibility of the knowledge of God for the heathen, and therefore his view becomes a frightening pronouncement of guilt. The reality of the heathen religions, which he had daily witnessed, showed him how the heathens perverted the revelation which they received from God through creation. Thus he continues, quote, And so they, the heathens, are without excuse, seeing that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks, for they have changed the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made like to corruptible man. End quote. Such critical statements about the heathen religions are not found in Cardinal Wojtyla. His judgment is strictly favorable. All are, quote, believers, no matter what their religion, end quote. And likewise, all have, quote, constantly recognized the voice of God in the language of creation, end quote. Such vague, careless formulations from a few council texts reflects the naively optimistic judgment of non-Christian religions by modern theology. As stated above, however, the main point of departure in the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis is what he calls, quote, man's inmost being. The encounter of the human spirit with God is essentially rooted in his nature. Man as man is capable, on the basis of his personal transcendence, of receiving the, quote, God of infinite majesty in the endless inner space of his mind, and also of experiencing him directly in the unio mystica. Hence, the Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis Religionum yields the following results. The members of the various religions, in context Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, turn with success to the God of Infinite Majesty. Page 16. The striking contrasts and contradictions among religions, including their fundamentally different notions of God, are no obstacles for the journey of man to God. No one asks about the legitimacy of the various religions' claims to the truth. Given the absolute transcendence of the encounter with God, the question is pointless. For the God of infinite majesty, whom the Cardinal identifies with the God of Revelation in Isaiah 6, is conceived as a pure abstraction which, quote, transcends absolutely the whole of creation, all that is visible and comprehensible, end quote. Hence, all concrete historical religions. In like manner, the encounter or the union with God is accomplished on the part of man in the trans-historical transcendence of the human person. Although for Cardinal Wojtyla, the encounter between God and man takes place beyond all creation in trans-historical transcendence, the historical religions do not lose their importance. On the contrary, the transcendent encounter or unio mystica between God and man as a possibility open to all men is also the foundation at the very root of all religions. This view coincides with that of Rudolf Otto in his modern theology of religions. Religions are, then, historical expressions of the human experience of transcendence, and in turn, a means of communicating that very encounter and union of man with the God of infinite majesty. They could be regarded altogether as various ways of salvation or channels of divine revelation, provided man is duly aware of his transcendence. Since all men partake in, quote, the wonderful transcendence of the human spirit in one way or another, end quote, all men are also united with the God of infinite majesty in a vast, mysterious community. Cardinal Wojtyla calls it the, quote, 
Church of the Living God. It encompasses all humanity. The confusion of nature and grace, church and humanity, is evident. The discarding of, quote, antiquated scholastic dualism has shown its first fruits. The thesis of universal salvation can be traced back to the Theologia Naturalis. The Cardinal's Theologia Naturalis Religionum is already a sufficient basis for an event like the prayer meeting of religions at Assisi in the year 1986. Part 3. The Thesis of Universal Salvation as an Axiom of the Theologia Revelata The God of infinite majesty, to whom, in the end, the believers of all religions turn, is also the God of the Covenant, page 19. The first covenant, which was offered to mankind in the first Adam, found its fulfillment in the second covenant of the second Adam, page 19 and following. Footnote. Cardinal Wojtyla admittedly speaks about this on page 25, where he says that the first covenant, quote, made when man was created, end quote, was destroyed. That is, quote, the covenant, shattered once by original sin, is to be rebuilt by redemption, with foundations that go deeper still, and even vaster dimensions." End quote. The destruction of the first covenant obviously does not mean that the descendants of Adam could no longer possess the similitudo dei. A consequence of the thesis of universal salvation is nominalism. End footnote. As the members of all religions are on the way to the God of infinite majesty, so are the people of God on the way to the God of the Covenant. It is a common pilgrimage of humanity and the people of God to the same goal, the same God, only under two different aspects. According to the thesis of universal salvation, the distinction between humanity and the people of God in their relationship to the God of all men is neither essential nor substantial but arises only through differing degrees of consciousness. Cardinal Wojtyla speaks of universal salvation in various terms. For example, the Son of God united himself with every man through his incarnation. Or, the redeeming death of Christ was the supernatural birth of man regardless of whether the man knows it or accepts it or not. Quote, At that moment, man's existence acquired a new dimension, very simply expressed by St. Paul as in Christ. End quote. The supernatural union of every man with the Son of God is founded directly on Christ. The axiom of universal salvation implies per se, a new Christology and soteriology. The thesis of universal salvation makes the Redeemer of man and the mystery of redemption appear even more universal than is the case in the Church's traditional teaching. In modern theology, the thesis of universal salvation has found its doctrinal expression in the vision of the, quote, cosmic Christ, with its scriptural basis in the letters to the Ephesians and Colossians, Ephesians 1, 3-23, Colossians 1, 13-23, to name only these sources. In evident contrast to the text of Holy Scripture, such a dualism as the clear distinction between cosmos and church is scorned by the vision of a, quote, cosmic Christ, which binds the universe and the human race, wholly and without distinction, 
to a cosmic unity in Christ. The work of such a cosmic Savior accomplishes not only the objective, but also the subjective universality of redemption, thus universal salvation. In the Meditazioni, Cardinal Wojtyla traces universal salvation back to three acts which God accomplished for our salvation, the incarnation of his Son, the death of Christ on the cross, and his resurrection. The three are seemingly mentioned promiscuously. One time it is the incarnation through which the Son of God united himself with every man. Another time it is the, quote, redeeming death of Christ by which every man partakes of existence in Christ, end quote, and the, quote, fullest and deepest community and solidarity with the entire human family, end quote, page 86, is realized. A third time, it is the death and resurrection of Christ through which an, quote, indissoluble link of the living God is created, quote, with every man, woman, and child, he is with the entire human family, end quote, page 93. Although it is the teaching of the Church that every individual action of Christ possesses an infinite value for our salvation, and that all Christ's actions make up the work of redemption, nevertheless, the work of redemption reached its high point in Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, so that this is primarily the efficient cause of our salvation. Denzinger Bonvat, 938. Supposing universal salvation, however, such distinctions become secondary, as merely so many attempts to explain the fact of justification, which all men possess anyway. Cardinal Wojtyla is himself thoroughly aware of the novelty of his, quote, more universal view of the Redeemer of man and of the mystery of redemption. But he sees therein no break with the preconciliar teaching of the Church, but only a, quote, more complete awareness of the mystery of Christ, end quote, which has been granted to Christendom, quote, by the opening which was accomplished by Vatican II, end quote. Hence, a new, more universal consciousness has come into being, a new, quote, Christ consciousness. Likewise, a new, more universal ecclesiology follows directly from the Cardinal's axiom of universal salvation. The Church comprises now all men who are effectively saved thanks to their transcendent depths. Pointing out the famous sentence in Lumen Gentium, number one, that the Church, quote, in Christ is a kind of sacrament or sign and instrument of unity with God and the unity of all mankind, end quote. The Cardinal says, quote, all men are embraced by this sacrament of unity, end quote, page 26. On the basis of universal salvation, humanity and the Church form one supernatural sacramental unity. Christ, the Bridegroom, is not only with the Church, but, quote, He is with every man, woman, and child. He is with the entire human family, end quote. Here, too, the Cardinal is completely aware of the novelty of his theological view, and here, too, he sees no break with traditional teaching, but only an expansion of, quote, consciousness, of which the Church partakes through Vatican II. There, the, quote, complete and universal consciousness of the Church, end quote, has been formed. It develops, quote, in dialogue, end quote. On account of the conciliar broadening of horizons, the Church has also, quote, redefined her own nature, end quote, page 17. Hence, 
a new universal consciousness has come into being, quote, church consciousness. The doctrinal difficulties which often come to light in the conflict between the new conciliar church consciousness and the historical reality of the church instituted by Christ are simply explained away through recourse to the Holy Spirit working in the hidden depths of man. Thus, we read this astonishing statement about the institution founded by Christ. Quote, Jesus built his church not so much upon himself as upon the Holy Spirit. He, Jesus the Christ, is only a servant, Mark 10.45, the servant of Yahweh in the Old Testament, Isaiah 42.1, a servant of the covenant, Corinthians 3.6, who will fulfill his destiny in dependence on the Spirit who is gift, end quote, page 57 to 58. But has the church not called upon and prayed to Jesus Christ as Kyrios from the beginning? The Cardinal's Christology, Ecclesiology, and Anthropology have their theological center in the thesis of universal salvation. With that, the circle of the Theologia Naturalis Religionum and Theologia Revelata of Cardinal Wojtyla is closed. From the standpoint of natural theology, there is the encounter or union of man with the God of infinite majesty, which is accomplished in man's personal transcendence, which then emerges in the Theologia Revelata as a salutary event based on the axiom of universal salvation. The Cardinal's thesis of universal salvation is nothing less than a false approach begun in his Theologia Naturalis and strengthened by a false axiom of his Theologia Revelata. What is presented from the standpoint of natural theology as, quote, the Church of the Living God, which, quote, unites all men, proves itself from the standpoint of his Theologia Revelata as essentially identical with the, quote, Church of our day, which, quote, has become particularly conscious of this truth. This view of the universal reality of salvation is Karl Wojtyla's counterpart to Karl Rahner's thesis of anonymous Christians and anonymous Christianity. Part 4. The Principles of Knowledge in the New Theology of Karl Wojtyla Now that we have elicited from the Meditazioni the concept of revelation, we are in a position, regarding the theological principles of knowledge, to present the special characteristic of the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla and to grasp it as a whole. The principles of knowledge in the Cardinal's new theology are, as in classical theology, revelation and faith. These, however, have undergone a drastic change in meaning. Part 4.1 The Twofold Revelation Although Cardinal Wojtyla chooses Vatican II constantly as the starting point of his theological meditations, he does not base his concept of revelation on the dogmatic constitution, Dei Verbum, in which the Council discusses revelation ex professo, but on a new specific passage from the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, number 22. The first fundamental definition of revelation reads, quote, This revelation is no theory or ideology. It consists in a fact the fact that by his incarnation the Son of God united himself with every man, became man himself, one of us, like us in all things but sin. End quote. 
page 102. Revelation does not mean here, as in classical theology, the locutio dei ad homines, but primarily the inner reality of the union of the Son of God with every man. This union should be understood in the sense of universal salvation. By describing the inner fact of universal salvation as revelation, the cardinal confines revelation to the subjectivity of man. That means that which in classical theology was the objective principle of knowledge appears in the cardinal's new theology as an imminent, natural, and subjective reality which is known prior to experience, a priori. Translator's footnote, a priori, i.e. prior to experience, therefore interior if not intuitive, a posteriori, i.e. based on experience, therefore exterior, empirical. End footnote. We can thus define the fact of universal salvation as revealed a priori in the subjectivity of every man is the first transcendental principle of knowledge in the new theology of Karl Wojtyla. Thus, like the fact of universal salvation, the a priori revelation is also universal. It is present in every man and in all religions. Cardinal Wojtyla elicits the second fundamental definition of revelation from the same key text of the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes, number 22. This text, it is claimed, illuminates, quote, the anthropological, even anthropocentric, character of the revelation offered to mankind in Christ. This revelation is centered on man. Christ fully reveals man to man himself, but he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love. End quote. John 17, 6. The quote, revelation which in Christ is offered to men, end quote, is naturally the historical revelation based on the teaching and example of Jesus. There is consequently a twofold revelation. The a priori revelation in the subjectivity of every man and the a posteriori historical revelation from the teaching and example of Jesus. Footnote. On the entire subject, see Bernhard Lackebrink as above, pages 75 to 107. Even if Lackebrink is mainly concerned with refuting Karl Rahner, his explanations are of such a fundamental nature that they can apply to any form of existentialist philosophy. We have employed the terms a priori and a posteriori, which are not used by Cardinal Wojtyla, but which nonetheless touch and throw light on the subject at hand. End footnote. The first concept of revelation corresponds with the second. After the union of the Son of God with each man has been accomplished, equaling revelation a priori, the, quote, revelation which is offered to men in Christ, end quote, equaling a posteriori, consists only in revealing to man the fact of his being redeemed. It is obvious, quote, this revelation is centered on man, end quote. The relation between a priori and a posteriori revelation is then still more precisely described and even concisely expressed. Quote, Christ reveals man to man himself. End quote. That means, quote, the mystery of man, which is, quote, enlightened through the a posteriori revelation offered in Christ, amounts to the thesis that each man possesses his, quote, existence in Christ a priori from the first moment of his existence, and indeed as his own deepest human existence. The deepest existence of man and, quote, existence in Christ are thus, for Cardinal Wojtyla, one and the same. In support of this thesis, the Cardinal appeals to the Apostle Paul. 
Is he authorized in doing so? Certainly one can say that, according to the Apostle Paul and the New Testament, the, quote, mystery of man is revealed through the, quote, mystery of the incarnate word. But this revelation means essentially that the word of God reveals to man his radical need for redemption on account of his sins, and the nature of his redemption is justification by faith and by the reception of baptism. Certainly, the Apostle Paul teaches that being redeemed by Christ is identical with existence in Christ, but nothing is more foreign to Paul than universal salvation and the identification of existence in Christ with the deepest existence of man, namely that of his own human existence. Thus, Paul's understanding of existence in Christ has nothing in common with that of Cardinal Wojtyla. When Paul and the Church speak of Christian existence as existence in Christ, they mean the state of grace of the justified sinner through faith and baptism. Moreover, faith is always the deciding factor in the relationship of man to Christ and to God for the redeemed and justified Christians, until that faith passes into the beatific vision. The justified Christian possesses existence in Christ in faith, a grace which surpasses his nature, quoad substantium. Every aspect of his Christian existence, rooted in faith and in grace, is and remains always Christocentric. Though the existence in Christ of justified sinners in classical theology is understood as a formal union with Christ, in truth, there is only an accidental union. Man retains his nature as man forever. His partaking in the trinitary life of God remains accidental and supernatural. The Cardinal's thesis of universal salvation thus does not mean that the state of grace of redeemed Christians, as the Church's traditional teaching presents it, would simply be communicated or extended to all men and be practically identical with the universal salvation of non-Christians. On the contrary, the thesis of universal salvation, which holds for all men, drastically changes the Church's former teaching on grace. The least one can say about the Cardinal's thesis of the identity of existence in Christ with the deepest elements of essence and existence in man is that, according to this theory, existence in Christ belongs to man's nature and the traditional dualism of nature and grace, from a theological standpoint, is thereby eliminated. But one must still ask the Cardinal, does the union of the Son of God with each man amount to an accidental or a substantial union? Is the self-revelation of God to man an accidental or substantial revelation? Such essential scholastic distinctions are widely lacking in the statements of Cardinal Wojtyla, Footnote. Of course, they are found clearly stated in the encyclical Dominum et Vivificantem of 1986. End footnote. Thus, the question of Cardinal Siri to Henri de Lubac should also be addressed to Cardinal Wojtyla. Quote, Is Christ only man, or is man divine? End quote. Our precise analysis of the phrase, quote, Christ reveals man to man himself, allows a clear definition of the Cardinal's thesis of universal salvation to come to light, as well as his a priori concept of revelation. Number one, the union of the Son of God with each man should be conceived as an inner, supernatural, ontological, a priori reality in each man, which presents the deepest essential foundation of human existence of each man, in whom, quote, the image and likeness of God is kept intact, end quote. 
This thesis is Karl Wojtyla's counterpart to Karl Rahner's quote, supernatural existence. Number two. Since universal salvation is characterized simultaneously as revelation, it thereby follows from the cardinal's a priori concept of revelation, not God, not Christ, but the human existence of man is the material object of revelation a priori. If the true human existence of man is the transcendental material object of revelation a priori, then revelation in general, and thus also the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla, has an anthropocentric character. The diametrical opposition to classical theology, in which God is the material object of theocentric theology, should be obvious. The anthropocentric character of revelation a posteriori is clearly expounded by the cardinal himself in the proposition where he states, quote, Christ reveals man to man himself, but he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love, end quote. Christ himself is assigned the role of the one who reveals the true human existence of man. The revelation of Father and the Father's love, that is, the entire body of historical revelation in the teaching and example of Jesus, finally Christ himself and also the Father, become the means of man's revelation. The a priori transcendental revelation latent in the dark caverns of man's subjectivity is interpreted by means of the historical a posteriori revelation, and thus fully comes out into the open. The empirical, historical revelation becomes the interpreter of human existence. That is what is meant by existential interpretation. The entire body of revelation in the teaching and example of Jesus is nothing more than the man's enlightenment about his true human existence. That is, therefore, the meaning of the cardinal statement, quote, revelation has an anthropocentric character, end quote. If every man from the beginning to the end of the world is redeemed and justified, see page 87, then each man possesses existence in Christ as the basis of his own existence, and the process of justification, the necessity of faith and baptism for salvation, is null and void. Then the history of salvation also loses its genuinely historical, decisive character. If every man from the beginning to the end of the world is redeemed and justified, see page 87, then each man possesses existence in Christ as the basis of his own existence, and the process of justification, the necessity of faith and baptism for salvation, is null and void. Then the history of salvation also loses its genuinely historical, decisive character. The mysteries of our salvation in the life of Christ, such as his incarnation, sacrifice on the cross, and his resurrection, become mere interpreters of human existence. They, quote, enlighten man on his deepest human existence and unveil, quote, the mystery of man. Cardinal Wojtyla's varying interpretation of human existence through the Savior's various deeds for the redemption of man is then no contradiction, but only the exposition of various aspects. Since the fact of existence in Christ is present in every man, the interpretation of this fact is a mere question of, quote, consciousness. With the anthropocentric revelation of Cardinal Wojtyla, the Church's preaching and missionary activity can thus only be concerned with man's, quote, enlightenment regarding his human existence, man's, quote, coming unto himself, and his expansion of consciousness. Footnote. For the question of how Cardinal Wojtyla conceives the relationship of universal salvation and God's economy of salvation, 
See above, page 60 and following. End footnote. If salvation and justification are immediately realized in each man as the universal act of salvation of the Father's love, then the interpretation of this fact, quote, by the revelation of the Father and the Father's love, end quote, also places the boundless love of the Father into the center of theology. There is still only one proper, quote, theology of boundless love, end quote. Footnote. The revelation of, quote, the Father and his love as a means of enlightenment of man's hidden existence leads directly into the depths of man and consequently to a, quote, theology of love. On that point, Cardinal Wojtyla says, quote, Love, an uncreated gift, is part of the inner mystery of God and is the very nucleus of theology. End quote. Page 55. One could agree with that if, in the Cardinal's new theology, the principles of knowledge, namely revelation and faith, were left untouched. Here, there is a shift of emphasis. It is not revealed truth in its inviolable objectivity, as formerly in classical theology, which is, quote, the very nucleus of theology, but the revelation offered in Christ, quote, from the Father and his love, as the interpretation of the nature of man. Revealed truth in its inviolable objectivity and the equally objective faith are driven out through the existentialist anthropocentric reference to the depths of man in the name of a boundless love. The thesis of universal salvation is not based on revealed truth. Therefore, it is derived from the love of God. Through universal salvation, the faith has lost its decisive character for salvation. Love, which is really impossible without faith, suddenly becomes all-important, and a mere human love at that, which then relegates faith to the area of personal preference. Love, as the guiding principle of theology, opens the door to a new theology of inwardness, which simply disregards the faith and paves the way for a theology of religions founded on the mysterious workings of the Holy Spirit. Love, as an, quote, uncreated gift, is the Holy Spirit in the, quote, depths of the human spirit. End footnote. Part 4.2 The Twofold Faith In classical theology, supernatural faith, fides qua creditur, is the subjective principle of knowledge. Faith means the submissive reception of the truths put forward by the supernatural revelation of God. God, in general, is the material object but the formal object of classical theology is the true God as he is known by the faith through revelation. As a science proceeding from faith, theology has, in addition, human reason as a special principle of knowledge, by which it permeates the contents and context of the organism of supernatural truth, and, as far as possible, seeks to understand it. Fides querens intellectum. Faith corresponds to revelation. As the concept of revelation in classical theology undergoes a drastic change in the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla, so too the classical concept of faith. The twofold revelation goes hand in hand with a twofold faith. The first premise of, quote, faith, 
corresponds to the axiom of universal salvation as revelation a priori, since it concerns the inner hidden fact of, quote, existence in Christ as the innermost depths of man, the, quote, mystery of man, which is enlightened through, quote, revelation offered in Christ, this transcendental a priori revelation as such can have no concrete empirical object of, quote, faith, but is only the condition for the reception of a future empirical, historical, a posteriori revelation. As a pre-existing transcendental structure of human existence, however, this a priori revelation generally takes its course on the journey of the human spirit to God. Like the fact of a priori revelation, so too the a priori faith is universal among men. In the Theologia Naturalis, the Cardinal defends the thesis that man is capable, on the basis of his personal transcendence, of receiving the God of infinite majesty in the endless inner space of his mind and to experience him mystically. From thence it follows that all men who on the basis of the quote, wonderful transcendence of the human spirit end quote, are quote, united in the church of the living God, end quote, page 17, can also in their respective religions attain genuine revelation, experience, and knowledge of God. But also, in the outside world through creation, all men have access to God. For, quote, all believers, no matter what religion they profess, have always understood him to speak and make himself evident in the discourse of creatures. End quote. Page 33. Members of all religions are thus, quote, believers. Their, quote, faith is not dogmatically laid down, but is rather a faith in humanity common to all religions. Footnote. See an expert in comparative religion, Friedrich Heile, Erscheinungsformen and Wissen der Religion, Stuttgart, 1961, in Die Religionen der Menschheit, Christel Matthias Schröder, Stuttgart, 1961, Volume 1, page 17, quote, Due concern for spiritual matters constitutes faith in a certain respect, yet by no means faith in the sense of dogmas stemming from a particular theological school or religious denomination. The greatest researchers of religion were men of faith, but men of a universal faith, a faith in humanity. They believed in God's revelation, but in his revelation in all religions of humanity. End quote. End footnote. In the Cardinal's Theologia Revelata, he defends the thesis of universal salvation, according to which each man possesses, quote, existence in Christ, as the transcendental foundation of his humanity. Since Christ, who enlightens every man, John 1, 9, has penetrated the heart of each man in which he is active, it follows that the innermost depths of the human spirit can or must lie at the root of something a priori authentically Christian in the faith and consciousness of anonymous Christians, so that even in non-Christian religions, authentically Christian values and truths are found. Does not Vatican II say as much in Nostra Etate, number two, where it points out the Father's teaching on the so-called Logoi Spermaticoi? Translator's footnote, i.e. seeds of the word, a Greek expression borrowed from Stoicism, principally by Clement of Alexandria and St. Justin Martyr in the second and third centuries after Christ, in order to designate certain elements of truth still present in heathen religions, these truths being either natural values of integrity, e.g. respect for parents and the aged, or simply traces of biblical revelation, e.g. notion of sacrifice and expiation. 
In all fairness, however, we must observe that neither Clement nor Justin would have dreamed of viewing these Logoi Spermaticoi as means of salvation proper to these false religions. Indeed, the same fathers do not fail to remark therein elements of the occult and the diabolical. Thus, a naively optimistic view of these false religions, even though the individual members be sincere and honest people, is no accurate appraisal of these religions as seen in God's eyes. Sincerity is plainly not enough. End footnote. At this point, various statements of Karl Rahner and Karl Wojtyla become clear. With Karl Rahner, the, quote, coming unto oneself of the anonymous Christian by which he then becomes a, quote, reflex conscious Christian is purely a transition of consciousness from the existentially given state to the categorically conscious state in the sense of a thorough existentialist idealism. This is not present in Karl Wojtyla's system he likewise finds a transition of consciousness necessary on the basis of his thesis of universal salvation, only he emphasizes the a posteriori revelation. It is Christ who, quote, reveals to man his deepest human existence, quote, but he does so by revealing the Father and the Father's love, end quote. Thus, the a posteriori revelation performs the function of midwife in the process of, quote, making conscious. Here is shown the great proximity between Cardinal Wojtyla and Henri de Lubac. With that, we come to the second premise of, quote, faith, which corresponds to the Cardinal's a posteriori conception of revelation the a priori receives its empirical historical object in the a posteriori revelation. Faith means, therefore, the acceptance of, quote, the revelation which in Christ is offered to men, end quote, but as a means of enlightening the true being of man's existence. After this, the cardinal can use the entire traditional vocabulary of empirical historical revelation, but it undergoes an anthropocentric, nominalistic transformation in the process. Just as the, quote, revelation offered to man in Christ has an, quote, anthropocentric character, so also the faith corresponding to it let us briefly recapitulate the content of this twofold faith in universal salvation. Man experiences that he is permanently united to the Son of God through the Incarnation, is saved and justified through Christ's death on the cross from the beginning to the end of the world, and possesses, quote, existence in Christ as the religious dimension of his own human existence, and owes everything to the love of, quote, God the Father. Since the work of redemption is basically accomplished in each man, in whom the image and likeness of God is also kept intact, the revelation offered in Christ can only serve to enlighten human experience, and thus the corresponding, quote, faith can only mean the enlightenment of human consciousness. Therefore, man must go into himself in order to discover himself in light of revelation faithfully received, which is offered to him in Christ, and thus finally experience that which he always was and is deep down. That is the meaning of the cardinal's phrase, quote, The mystery of man is explained in the mystery of the incarnate word, end quote. This brand of faith calls to mind the gnosis, ancient or modern. Translator's footnote. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge and has come to mean a system where salvation consists not in submitting the mind to fixed dogmas and obeying a moral code, 
but rather in the possession of a quasi-intuitive knowledge of the mysteries of the universe. This system was historically associated with pantheism, idealism, and religious syncretism. The reader will readily notice the tie-ins with modernism, the, quote, cosmic Christ, Assisi, and the New Age movement. Among other things, it is the confusion of philosophy and mysticism. End footnote. We may thus maintain the principles of knowledge of revelation and faith in Cardinal Wojtyla's new theology have an existentialist, anthropocentric character, so that one can speak of an anthropocentric theology, of a transcendental anthropology, and of a theology of man. It leads automatically to a, quote, fundamental anthropocentrism. See Cardinal Siri. The Cardinal's new theology provides an extensive foundation for interreligious dialogue. The, quote, Church of the Living God, page 17, unites all men. Universal salvation is the common basis. The concepts of revelation and faith are not proper to the Catholic religion. All religions contain genuine revelation. The faith encompasses all believers in all religions. Genuine faith is faith in humanity. But, quote, revelation, which is offered to man in Christ, end quote, thus the Christian faith, is, for Cardinal Wojtyla, the faith in which the, quote, mystery of man, quote, existence in Christ, is, quote, enlightened once and for all. Footnote. Mutatis mutandi. One could perhaps describe this position of the cardinal, which follows from the thesis that all are redeemed, with the words of Karl Rahner, who presents his position with the following words. The non-Christians, quote, are already anonymous Christians, and the church is not the community of them who possess, as opposed to those who lack God's grace, but the community of those who can profess explicitly what they and the others hope to be. It may seem presumptuous to the non-Christians that the Christian considers salvation and sanctification in every man as the fruit of the grace of his Christ and as anonymous Christianity, and regards the non-Christian as a Christian not yet come to himself by reflex. But the Christian cannot abandon this presumption. It is indeed an occasion for himself and the Church for the greatest humility, for it allows God to be, once again, greater than men and the Church. The Church will meet the non-Christian of tomorrow with the statement expressed by Paul, What therefore you worship, and indeed worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. Acts 17.23 As a result, one can be tolerant, modest, and yet unbending towards all non-Christian religions. End quote. Schriften zur Theologie, 1962, page 158. This, quote, offer is thus by no means necessary for salvation, nor is it exclusive or binding. There is also revelation, faith, and the experience of God in other religions. On the basis of religious liberty, interreligious dialogue as a brotherly exchange of religious experiences for the sake of mutual enrichment is the primrose path towards universal religious harmony. The question remains to be answered. Is the new theology of Cardinal Wojtyla also the theology of Pope John Paul II? And if so, does it constitute the theological core of his papal encyclicals? <laughs>